The couch reeked of cigarette smoke, ashes, and body odor. It was faded yellow like the wallpaper, its springs creaking loudly as I sat down. It smells like him, I thought to myself, surveying my late father's living room and its precarious stacks of old books and magazines. I couldn't help but sigh. It was going to take forever to clean this place up. A fat cockroach ventured out from the couch cushions and began to scuttle across my bare arm. I stood up, feeling sick, and saw several more of varying sizes abandoning the couch like a sinking ship. It's a good thing I brought rubber gloves, I thought to myself, flinging a large bug off my arm and an N95 mask. I was about to put those things on when the lights in the house went out all at once. It was suddenly pitch black inside the living room and silent. The humming background noise of electronics and home appliances conspicuously absent. I could only hear the dull thud of my heart in my ears, accompanied by a nocturnal orchestra of crickets outside the window. <sighs> Why had I chosen to come here at night to clean up? It was spooky enough just being inside the house. Especially after he died last month sitting right there in his favorite recliner. Ghosts feel so much realer in the night when nobody else is around. As I thought about that, a chill ran down my spine and the room seemed to grow a bit colder. In the darkness, I pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight function. The harsh white light cast the room in a bright glow and I surveyed the crowded, messy space around me. A narrow path through the piles of junk led towards the kitchen and from there I could go downstairs to reset the breakers. The old house did this from time to time. The blackouts were common. Its original wiring and circuits were not designed for the strains of modern electricity. Starting to make my way through the piles of faded magazines and newspapers, I edged my way sideways and sucked in my gut at one narrow section to get through the kitchen. Once there, I tried to ignore that rotten smell which greeted me. Sweet and sour aromas of spoiled food, and something else much worse beneath that. It occurred to me there might be something dead inside one of the cupboards. It could have been a mouse or a rat for all I knew. Neither one would surprise me. Opening the door at the top of the stairs, I began to make my way down the steps. They creaked and groaned beneath my weight, and I made sure to cast the light towards my feet to avoid falling. The stairs were lined with stacks of old journals and magazines, printed news articles and folders bulging with Dad's papers. His research, as he had called it. I felt a pang of regret, wishing I had tried to understand him better. He had grown emotionless and reclusive over the years, paranoid that others were mocking him for his theories. He truly believed that there were things from another world living among us, invisible and in the shadows. We'd never been able to convince him to seek help as much as we tried, and my mother had eventually left him after years of emotional neglect. I was careful to avoid the wobbly stacks as I made my way down the stairs to the lower level, as I imagined they would collapse like dominoes if I knocked something over. The precarious towers swayed and bent with my weight, pressing down on each step. I cringed, picturing one tipping over, causing a cascading effect that would somehow turn the whole house to rubble like a massive Rube Goldberg machine. My breathing stopped as I heard something moving down in the shadows of the basement, further within the blackened space. It sounded like it was coming from the direction of my dad's old office. Probably just mice, I told myself stepping from the bottom stair onto the linoleum tiles of the basement. They crinkled and crunched beneath my feet, yellowed and brittle with ancient water damage. The sound in the distance stopped immediately and my skin broke out in goose flesh as I began to tread hesitantly forward towards the source of it. The breaker box was in the furnace room. I would go to it and flip the switches, then go back upstairs to clean. There was no way I was going to investigate that sound coming from ahead to the left, deeper in the basement. That was the kind of stupid thing they did in horror movies right before getting killed. 
creeping forward, being careful not to touch any of the precarious stacks, I finally arrived at the furnace room door on the right. As I pushed it open, that sound came again from the office, through the den which was just to the left of me. A noise like papers rustling and things being shuffled around. It immediately made me feel uneasy, my throat tightening with fear as I thought about my theory that the noises were made by a mouse. That no longer seemed possible. Whatever was making that sound, it was larger than a mouse. A raccoon, maybe? No. A possum? No. Definitely bigger than that. Rushing faster, I nearly ran into a stack of boxes, which was just around the corner inside the furnace room. The idea of knocking something over and becoming pinned beneath a pile of magazines, while that rustling sound grew ever closer, was too much for me to handle. Nearly in a panic, I ran across the small cement floor room to the breaker box. I reached up for the lever and gripped it firmly, pulling it down, then jammed it back up into the on position again. Nothing happened. The room was still drenched in blackness, aside from the beam of my cell phone's flashlight, and that rustling sound continued in the distance, undeterred by my presence. My heart thudding in my chest, I reached out and pulled the lever down and back up again, resetting it once more. The lights remained stubbornly dim. And then I realized, of course, I hadn't flipped on the light switch at the door of the furnace room. None of the basement lights were turned on, so I couldn't even tell if resetting the breakers had worked. So I walked away from the breaker box and flipped the switch on the wall near the door, expecting the lights to turn on. But they didn't. It was still pitch black in the basement of my dead father's house. And the longer I spent down there, the less comfortable I felt. My skin was tingling with a sensation telling me something was down there with me my primal lizard brain instincts urging me to run. I quickly realized why that was. The sound of rustling papers from my father's office was gone, replaced by a swishing sound indicating movement. Whatever that thing was, it was larger than a raccoon or a possum, and it was headed straight for me. More afraid than I'd ever felt in my life, I stepped out of the room and began to move through the stacks of papers which lined the basement floor to ceiling, wall to wall. I tried to walk at first, pretending that the sound like a large lizard moving in the night wasn't real. But then, as it got closer and I heard its bulk scrape against the door frame of the den just behind me, I started to run. Too terrified to look back, I began to push over the stacks of magazines and papers, knocking them over with my hands as I ran past. The stacks toppled over, sending a collapsing chain reaction of junk towers in the thing's direction. Whatever it was, it made a pained sound unlike anything I'd ever heard before. It was a dark, alien sound. A high-pitched shriek mixed with an undulating drone like a swarm of bees beneath that. Unable to stop myself from looking, I pointed the light from the phone in the thing's direction and all I could see were the boxes and papers being knocked aside by some invisible force in the darkness. Whatever it was, I couldn't see it for some reason. But it could see me. And it was headed for me again, as indicated by the papers being knocked aside in its wake. Running as fast as I could up the stairs, I got to the top just as the thing began to bound up the steps from the bottom. I pushed over the stack of boxes near me, sending over another domino wave of junk which toppled over and crashed into the bulk of the thing chasing me. It was already so close. In the short amount of time it had taken me to push the piles of junk over, it had nearly reached the top of the stairs. Still, my plan had worked, and I heard the sound of it tumbling loudly down the steps. Panting and out of breath, I went through the door to the main level and slammed it shut behind me just as the thing caught up again, its claws scraping and scratching against the wood. I pulled the deadbolt closed as it pounded with its weight against the threshold. The door rattled and shook in its frame as I held it shut with all of my body weight, feeling it pound against my back and hoping that whatever this thing was, it did not have claws which could pierce through the flimsy barrier I'd made between us. After a while, the pounding stopped. The dark house was silent once again, and I thought I heard the sound of it retreating down the stairs into the basement. 
but as I listened closely, I could still hear the sound of its breathing, raspy and quick. What are you? I asked through the door, and the sound abruptly ceased. For a long time I just listened, waiting for it to go back down into the basement again, or just to breathe again so I knew where it was. I couldn't tell if it was behind the door or not, and after a while I began to almost wonder if I had just imagined it all. Was there really an invisible creature living in the basement beneath my dad's house? The whole thing seemed impossible. Whatever had happened to the power, my attempts to reset the breakers had done nothing. It was still pitch black throughout the house. My phone had plenty of battery, so I cast its light around the room where I sat with my back against the door. The stacks of books and magazines were still standing upright, unlike down in the basement where it was now in shambles. That was when I heard the sound of the thing descending the stairs, its footfalls noisy amidst the mess. I could tell exactly where it was based on those sounds. A very unusual thought occurred to me hearing the creature heading back to the basement. I stood up and picked up a folder from one of the wobbly stacks in the kitchen. It was stuffed with pages of text, the margins thin and the print packed tightly together in a tiny font. I began squinting my way through the text and was amazed to see it was all written by my father. And it was all about the thing in the basement. It appeared to be a continuation of a previous document which I could find no trace of. The pages were all scrambled and out of order, disjointed fragments of memories and recollections. Creature is clever. First the light, then the heat. Makes me go down there every time. It knows I have to go down there. Fix the furnace. Reset the breakers. Repeat. It's gotten so big. I remember when it was so small, so easy to ignore. I could almost pretend it was just a cold breeze moving things around and causing the hairs to stand up on the back of my neck. It feeds on memories. It feeds on thoughts and feelings. Do I feel anything anymore? Do I even feel fear? Yes. The answer is yes. Every time I go down there, the answer is yes. I will kill it somehow. Kill it. It kill, kill, kill it. Will until it kills it or it kills me. How do you defend yourself from something you cannot see? That last bit of garbled text made me feel sick to my stomach as I thought about Dad's final days and his confused and paranoid state in the hospital. Looking up from the pages, I surveyed the crowded room and realized he had managed to defend himself from the creature in a way. He'd made a fortress out of his research, just to keep the thing away, and to warn him if it was coming. And then I realized the worst part. I had just unwittingly destroyed that barrier of protection. The temperature began to plummet in the room, and I realized I'd have to go back down there again. Not that minute, but sooner or later, I'd have to face the creature again. Otherwise, the house would remain cold, dark, and unlivable. I picked up another stack of papers and began to look through them in the glow of my cell phone light. There were more rambling pages, many of which made no sense whatsoever. The text written sideways or spiraling in crude print towards the center of the page but then I would find one where my father had written coherently about the monster, describing exactly what he had learned. Another section caught my eye, and I read it carefully, growing more and more terrified with each sentence. It's gotten through the locks again. I'll have to lure it downstairs with another bribe. Oh, I hate doing it, but it's the only way. The poor creatures, they don't deserve this, but they are pests. Still, I don't like it but it's better than having that thing up here with me on the main level, creeping around and doing God knows what in the shadows. I don't trust it. The thing, I've begun to call it Samuel. I don't know why. It started to learn how to mimic sounds. It's like a ventriloquist casting its voice across the room and making you think it's leaving when really it's still just sitting right next to you. What am I going to do? How am I going to get rid of this thing before it takes everything from me? I've already lost my family. What will I lose next? 
I looked up from this page written by my father to see the basement door was now hanging wide open, revealing the darkness leading downstairs. The sound of footsteps could be heard coming towards me again as the towers of paper began to topple, this time towards me. The stacks of books and magazines, papers and folders stuffed with documents, they all began to tip over, landing on me and pinning me to the floor. A moment later, I could smell the creature's rank odor as its invisible face floated above me, examining me. I shook with fear, feeling its gaze on me, feeling it taking something indefinable from me, like I was losing a part of myself, the very thing which made me, me. It's in the room with me now, sniffing through the cupboards and the pantry for more dead rat carcasses while I remain pinned to the floor beneath a thousand piles of junk mail and rambling missives. I'm reading through the pages around me frantically, trying to find something, anything that will help. I'm clueless as to what I should do right now. It feels like I should know, but I've somehow forgotten some very critical things. Memories that were very important which the monster has deigned to feast upon. Who do I call if I need help? Why can't I remember anymore? The creature is coming back to feed again, sniffing at my face in the darkness, pondering what it will take next. It feeds on all sorts of things. And it's always hungry. I've had a fear of rats for as long as I can remember. I don't know exactly what it is about them that scares me. It's not just the tail, or the way they move, or how they sound. It's everything, and it's nothing. To me, rats have always been synonymous with unconditional terror. It all comes from a childhood trauma. A large rat chased me up a hill, where I had to hide in a tool shed. The thing seemed rabid, and I had to sit in there for at least an hour listening to the squeals and cries of the desperate thing that wanted to eat me. It was an unusually big rat, larger than some cats I've seen. It's called musophobia, and up until recently it hadn't really been an issue. I mean, sure, I can get my panic attacks and a flight reaction by just seeing one, but I've been able to keep them out of my life more often than not. Sure, now that I'm a parent, I won't let my two kids have a hamster, but... I'm pretty sure the Yorkshire Terrier we have keeps them busy. My phobia became an issue not too long ago. I was driving the kids home from school. Traffic was being rerouted for maintenance, so I had to take a smaller dirt road instead of staying on Main. It wasn't far and there was barely any traffic. The road goes by a set of fishing cabins, set up around the lake, but was extended to lead back to the main road further up ahead. Usually, there's nothing but frogs there. As I drove by, a small family of six rats ran straight across the road. This had never happened to me before. My body spasmed. My mind blanked. I panicked and turned the car straight into a pine tree. It was such a strange feeling. I heard this loud scream and tried to cover my ears, but only realized I was the one screaming. My oldest daughter managed to call 911. My reaction was far scarier to them than the crash itself. We were fine. I was driving slowly and everyone turned out to be okay. Even the car was okay after some light body work. However, my wife insisted I start going to therapy to deal with this fear once and for all. I couldn't say no. Not again. There aren't many mental health professionals in the nearby area, so the list of available therapists wasn't long. I could go for two sessions a week if it wasn't too far away. I was looking for assisted exposure therapy, and truth be told, I was a bit on edge about the whole thing. My wife was the driving force behind this decision, so she pretty much just pointed me where to go. She chose to sign me up for a session with Dr. Jane Bogan. Dr. Jane was excited to see me. She was in her 40s and had this combed-back, Alvira-looking hairdo, but without the volume. At first sight, you might mistake her for a medium or a psychic. It wasn't the best first impression, but her credentials checked out. We shook hands, her wrist rattling with jewelry and chains. She insisted I call her Jane. 
The office was kind of murky. Dark gray wallpaper with a matching carpet. Plenty of bookshelves, with a desk set up by the corner. And of course, fancy leather lounge chairs. The kind you can straighten out to lie down in. Her office assistant, Jeremy, offered me a coffee and a donut before returning to an adjacent room. Apparently he helped all four offices in the building with their scheduling, but Jane was the only one working today. Jeremy was a short, balding man with a tired look. He had some kind of accent, but I couldn't put my finger on what. European, I think. Today he's all ours, Jane joked. Jeremy didn't laugh. Jane and I had a long talk about my phobia. I told her about the tool shed on top of that grassy hill and the screeching sounds of the rabid rat. The desperate scratching, trying to make a dent in the front door. I told her about the car crash, and about how my body just seized up and refused to let me act. Jane was a very active listener, asking follow-up questions and making notes along the way. She nodded, made eye contact, and seemed very attentive. She was good, and just talking openly about my fear was refreshing. At the end of the first session, Jane explained her thoughts to me. Until next time, I'll present a treatment plan, but I can already say you are a prime candidate for overexposure therapy. Do you mean exposure therapy? I asked. No, this is different. She smiled and touched my hand. Overexposure is slightly different, but far more effective in the long run. It also doesn't require you to actually meet or touch any rats. It can be done right here in the office. Really? I... Never heard of it. I'm licensed to perform it, she said and stood up. She pointed out a diploma next to her desk. Right there, underneath a degree from Minnesota State, was a license from the Board of Behavioral Health and Therapy. It looked official enough, and I didn't have a reason to distrust her. I agreed to discuss it with my wife. Of course, it wasn't much of a discussion. I didn't mind trying something new, and my wife was overjoyed to see me progressing. We tried looking up overexposure therapy, but it didn't give us anything. Most links were just explaining how regular exposure therapy works. I didn't like the idea of facing my fear, but with the guidance of Dr. Jane, it felt a bit easier. She was a professional, after all. I called her and agreed to the treatment. She explained it would be best to set aside a full day for it. We booked the upcoming Saturday. It wouldn't be cheap, but she guaranteed a breakthrough. I'd wager my reputation on it, she laughed. The next Saturday, I kissed my wife goodbye and left to see Dr. Jane. I was nervous. But seeing my girls wave goodbye as I pulled out of the driveway calmed my heart. They were so worried about me. I, I had to get better. When I got to Dr. Jane's office, she was waiting for me in the parking lot. Jeremy was there as well, despite it being a Saturday. My car was the only one in the parking lot, making me wonder if Jane lived nearby and walked to work. As I got out of the car, I noticed Jeremy holding a cup of coffee and a donut. We hadn't even stepped inside yet. He didn't blink much. Glad you could make it, Jane said. It's going to be a long day. Jeremy handed me the coffee and donut and we entered the office. One of the lounge chairs was set up so I could lie down. I noticed how Jeremy lingered in the room until Jane stared him down. Then she turned her attention to me. It felt like staring into a furnace. Have a seat. I laid down as she dimmed the lights. Close your eyes, and don't be alarmed, she continued. What are you... I didn't have time to say anything else. Jane touched her thumb to my forehead, and my mind was set on fire. That's the only way I can explain the sensation. My mind flared, and there was an intense heat. Wave after wave, fanning out from the point on my forehead she touched. Heat, then freezing cold. There was a taste of metal and a smell of burning rubber like getting a tattoo on my brain. I couldn't open my eyes, and I couldn't feel my hands or feet. It felt like I was sinking into the chair deeper and deeper. Relax, a disembodied voice demanded. I felt my breath stopping, my heart slowing. Fire turned to ice. I could have sworn I was dying, but my body didn't respond. I was losing control. Then my eyes burst open. It felt like breaching the surface after diving too deep. 
My pulse shot through my body like an automatic rifle. I was shaking, and my eyes teared up. To call it disorienting would be an understatement. I was still in the office, but it was night. I'd arrived at ten in the morning, and now it was close to midnight. Jane was gone. Jeremy, too. My pockets were empty. I called out, but there was no response. I was alone. I opened the office door and stepped out to the parking lot, only to realize I was actually far from alone. There was Jeremy. His eyes were wide open and seemed larger than usual. The pupils were of different sizes. His mouth was open like a panting dog, revealing a tongue long enough to reach his belly button. He was completely naked and covered in deep, bloodless cuts. He stood in the middle of the parking lot under the single working light post. He seemed taller, like stretched, soft plastic. We locked eyes. His mouth curled into a smile, never blinking, never closing his mouth. And now he was sprinting toward me with complete abandon. Naked feet slapped against the concrete. He almost tripped as he stumbled across the curb. I slammed the door shut. Jeremy's entire body weight slammed against the door with a deep splat. The door buckled but held. Jeremy was screaming. It was a pained, primal shriek like someone being set on fire. All enveloping pain expressed in a rasping and dry voice. I hurried back into the office. One of the bookshelves looked loose, so with enough force I'd be able to tip it. I had to try. The bookshelf itself wasn't heavy, but the over 100 books on psychology held it down. I summoned all my strength and tipped the whole thing in front of the door. I sat down, back to the bookshelf. I noticed I was screaming too, yelling at him to stop and leave me alone. It wasn't a conscious decision, it just happened. I was so disoriented, it seemed like time was standing still. As Jeremy broke through the door leading in from the parking lot, I braced myself. He flung himself against the office door, but the added weight of the bookshelf and myself was enough to keep it shut. Stop! I heard myself scream. Please just stop! I scrambled to hold him back, cutting my thumb open on a splinter. I didn't even notice it until my hand started slipping from my blood. As I stared across the room, I could see the full moon outside the office window. Slowly... A face appeared on the other side of the glass, stepping out of the dark. A woman I'd never seen before, hairless, also with deep cuts across her skin. Eyes wide, pupils differently sized. Her mouth wide open, her long tongue pressed against the glass like a dying eel. No, I heard myself sigh. Please, just no. She nodded as her mouth turned into a sinister smile. Using her arms and face, she started to break herself against the glass. She didn't bleed from the cuts. I didn't know what to do until the glass shattered. I bolted to the left through the side door to the hallway. I followed the corridor to the right as the office door broke behind me. Jeremy was through. I could hear the two of them panting as they chased me. I saw two options. Get out through a window or lock myself in the bathroom. I refused to corner myself, so I chose the window. I smashed it with my elbow and climbed out, feeling cold fingers brush against my neck. It was cold outside and dark. I just ran, hearing the panting behind me. I followed a path into a pine forest, getting scratches from the trees across my face. It is nothing short of a miracle that I didn't trip. I paid no attention to my feet. As the ground turned upward to a hill, I lost my breath. I knew this hill, and this couldn't be here. It was the same hill where I'd been chased into a tool shed as a kid. And there it was. There was nowhere else for me to go. They were faster and I had to find cover. This was impossible, though. I'd done this once before and now I was doing it again. I ran up the hill, flung open the wooden door, and shut it behind me. The door had a slide bolt, so I locked it. There were no windows, but the entire shed was flimsy at best. I cursed myself. This was just another dead end. For minutes, it was quiet. Maybe they hadn't followed me. Maybe they took a different path. I relaxed my breath, feeling blood return to my fingers and toes. Then they came. They smashed themselves against the door. They tore at the frail planks. The pained screams exploded and echoed across the hillside. I couldn't hear myself think. 
Desperate, I looked where to go next, but I was cornered. It can't end like this, I panted. It can't. It won't. Not like this. I cried. I pleaded. There were more of them now, at least six. One of the planks on the left side broke off and five arms reached for me. Pale arms with deep, bloodless cuts. The full moon reflected unblinking eyes and long, slithering tongues. Not like this. The slide bolt had lost two screws. It was a matter of seconds. No. I armed myself with a claw hammer as the door burst open. Jeremy was the first one in, but I didn't get the chance to attack. Three different arms grabbed me, disarmed me, and pushed me onto the floor. Cold, naked flesh pressed against me. Countless eager faces drooled with delight as teeth pierced my neck. Then I woke up. The clock showed twenty minutes past five in the afternoon. I was on the floor of Dr. Jane's office, curled up in a fetal position. There was a cold towel on my head, and Dr. Jane was calmly stroking my shoulder. My head was warm, and a great headache was subsiding. Jeremy was nowhere around. There we go, she whispered. You're fine, you're fine. I couldn't speak. I was shaking like a leaf. Jane helped me back up in the seat. That was the end of the treatment, she smiled. You're done. What? What? What was that? I'd completely forgotten why I was there in the first place. Jane reached for something. Hold out your hands, she said. I did as she asked. A second later, a small white mouse was placed in my palms. The confused little thing just sniffed me and stood on its hind legs. I didn't react. In my mind, I was about to be eaten alive just seconds ago. You seem to be cured, Jane smiled. Treatment successful. You can give him back now if you want. I wouldn't mind holding him for a bit. I really didn't. I wanted the little mouse to stay. It was a tiny comfort. A living creature I could feel meant me no harm. Good, nodded Jane. So, what did... I mean, what happened? You were overexposed, said Jane, filling out some paperwork. An extreme stress reaction dampens all other reactions. I don't understand. Say you have an oven with four settings, she continued, four being the highest setting. That's where you were with your fear of rats. Maximum power, strength four. She handed the paper over to me. It was her bill for the day. I changed your maximum setting to ten. Suddenly a four doesn't seem so bad. But how? She sat down across from me and locked her eyes to mine. There was something dark in there. A hint of red. I'm very good at what I do. She took my hand and turned it over. That's when I noticed the cut along my thumb. I was allowed to keep the white mouse. I bought him a little cage, some toys, and plenty of food. When I got home that night, my wife couldn't believe her eyes. My girls named the mouse Kenny. And he was gently played with late into the night much to our Yorkie's dismay. My wife called it a miracle, but I didn't know what to call it. My mind was still in a daze. I find myself thinking back to that day. It wasn't a dream, or a vision. It was real. It, it had to be. Thumbs don't cut themselves on imaginary splinters. Sometimes I find myself staring into the mirror, seeing my pupils dilate into different sizes. It feels like my tongue has grown longer. Hell, my forehead seems to have a slight magnetic pull where Dr. Jane touched me. It's a very unusual kind of headache. There was also an incident just a few days ago where I cut my finger dicing potatoes. Not a drop of blood came out. I barely even felt it. I can't bring myself to go back to Dr. Jane. If there is even a slight chance she'll put me back on that hill, 
I won't ever talk to her or see her again. I might have had the fear of rats scared out of me. But it has been replaced by this deep, existential dread for what Dr. Jane could do to me if she wanted to. What has she done to me? And why can't I bleed? The dark room was filled with the whirring sounds of hard drives and the pale blue glow of computer monitors. An occasional burst of static from one of the walkie-talkies at the charging station would break the silence between me and the other security guard, who was trying unsuccessfully to keep his eyes open. Doesn't anything interesting ever happen around here? I asked Peter, my new supervisor. I mean, I figured most of the rumors were bogus, but isn't anything about this place true? Skinwalkers? Glowing orbs? Oh, come on, you gotta have a few stories at least. He had his feet up on the desk in the security office, and several dozen monitors showing different angles of the property were displayed on screens all around. The billionaire who owned the ranch had spared no expense trying to capture the paranormal presences of Skinwalker Ranch on camera, but so far, from what I understood, he had been completely unsuccessful. You watch way too many History Channel specials, kid, the guy said, barely opening his eyes to look at me. I realized he was falling asleep. There's nothing here but a rich guy with too much cash and an army of underpaid acolytes like you and me, busting our asses to document a whole lot of nothing. So what's with the body armor and the tasers and all the safety equipment? I'm surprised they don't have us packing heat with all this stuff strapped to us. We looked like SWAT officers, which was completely ridiculous considering our job descriptions mostly involved eating boxed lunches and trying not to bore ourselves to death. I'd used up most of the battery life on my phone playing Angry Birds, and was now forced to sit and make conversation with this jaded, grumpy guy. Dude, shut up and quit asking so many questions. One day the old man will get wise that E.T. ain't coming. Until then, just sit back and enjoy the gravy train, okay? I grunted in agreement and sat watching the monitors as Peter began to snore. I couldn't believe he was actually going to sleep on the job and while training me, no less. Looking at the time, I saw it was past 3 a.m. Well, only another four hours until the morning shift arrived. But I knew from previous jobs with previous graveyard shifts that this was the hardest time of night to stay awake. I needed another cup of coffee or I would soon be asleep like Peter, and at least one of us had to keep an eye out for the boss. There was no way of knowing when the old eccentric billionaire would come wandering over for a look at the video feeds and to make sure his hired goons were bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. He'd been known to pop in for surprise visits. Since I needed the job and couldn't afford to lose it, I decided a fresh cup of coffee was in order. I snuck out of the security office and went into the adjoining room where a single-serve coffee machine was plugged in on a counter beside a mini-fridge. Yawning, I stuck a Keurig pod in the mouth of the machine and snapped the mechanism closed, pressing the button for a large coffee. The thing began to chug and click and gurgle, before spitting out some hot, steaming black brew. Taking the cup with me back to the security office, I blew on it and cupped my hands around it to absorb some of its warmth. The office was getting chilly as the night droned on. As I re-entered the security room, I was unsurprised to find Peter still snoring. I blew on my coffee again, quieter this time, and sat back down, looking at the monitors with forced open eyes. Something caught my attention on the monitor to the right. The barn door was swinging open, slapping against the adjoining wall in the strong wind. It hadn't been open before. Yo, Peter, wake up. Why is the barn door open? I had to shake him a few times and ask him the question again, but eventually he blinked his eyes open long enough to peer at the monitor. Boss man's probably out there polishing the ATVs or something. Why do you care? If there was a perimeter breach, it would have set off an alarm. Cleaning the four-wheelers at 3 a.m.? Why would he do that? Peter's eyes opened up all the way, then he closed them again. Yeah, you're right. It's probably a test. He likes to do that sometimes. Make sure we're not sleeping on the job. You go out there, newbie. I'll stay here and watch the feeds. He put his helmet over his eyes, and I could hear him resume snoring a moment later. If the boss was out there, I wasn't going to cover for Peter, I thought to myself. 
This guy was useless. It seemed like he didn't know the first thing about property protection or security procedures. I was worried if something really did happen, he'd be useless. Or would do more harm than good in a crisis. But luckily, we were on a farm out in the middle of nowhere. Besides, nothing bad ever happens at Skinwalker Ranch, despite its reputation. Or so I thought. As I made my way out through the hallways of the farmhouse, which had been converted into a makeshift security compound, I found myself feeling nervous. Something about this wasn't right. The idea that the boss was out in the barn at 3 a.m. testing our preparedness didn't jive with me, but I suppose it was possible. Stepping out into the cool night air, I looked across the driveway at the barn, not more than a hundred yards away. The noise of the untethered barn door banging against the wood could be heard loudly now, and sounded to my ears like an omen of evil. A fat orange moon hung low in the sky, its awful gravity pulling me towards the blood-red building. I found myself standing before the open door, the smell of hay wafting out from inside. Close the door. Go back to the security office, I thought suddenly. Whatever you do, don't step foot inside that barn. It's cursed. It's evil. Stay out. I didn't understand why I felt that way, but I did. Some voice in my mind was saying to run from this place and never come back. Something started murmuring from the shadows inside as if in agreement. It sounded like a man, but their tones were hushed and quiet and difficult to understand. Who's in there? I called out, taking out my flashlight from my belt and shining it into the barn. No one answered, and the mumbling, chanting voice continued. Peter, come in, I said into the radio. But as soon as the words escaped my lips, the walkie-talkie made a painful, high-pitched squeal of feedback, then clicked loudly and was dead. Hello? I said again into the useless device. There was no response, and I had no way of knowing if he'd heard me or not. It's probably just the boss trying to catch us slacking off, I thought to myself, considering what Peter had said earlier. I would simply go inside and turn on the light. Then the rich owner would give me a pat on the back for my prompt action and response to the practice scenario. With that thought firmly in mind, I entered the barn, my heart racing. My body knew what my mind had not yet realized, that I was in terrible danger. When I got inside the barn, the huge wooden door slammed shut behind me, and I knew I was in trouble. The murmuring, chanting thing in the darkness continued its deliberate cadence as I turned and tried to get out, clawing at the door and trying desperately to pull it open. One of my fingernails broke off and began to bleed, but I didn't notice that until later, as the adrenaline was pumping through my veins. A moment later, the door itself disappeared. Its edges dissolved into the surrounding wood and I backed away from it, terrified, looking up at where it had been a moment before. Such a thing was impossible. And yet, it had happened just before my eyes. I was trapped. Spinning around, I saw the thing in the shadows, still chanting and now swaying back and forth. Its silhouette in the darkness reminded me of a shaman mixed with a wolfman, holding a wand or a scepter of some kind. The head of the scepter rattled and made awful, fleshy sounds like teeth being shook in a sack made of skin. I tried not to listen to the things the creature was saying, as the words felt like worms crawling through my ears and into my gray matter, invading my thoughts. It was like an itch I couldn't scratch, like a dozen black flies crawling on my brain where I couldn't get to them, taking occasional bites and sampling the local cuisine inside my skull. Get out of my head! I heard myself scream, but the wicked chanting continued. The language was ancient and unknowable, not resembling anything I'd heard before. Clutching my skull, that horrible, itching sensation of something worming its way into my mind continued, undeterred by my protests. I looked around and saw other dark forms were in the barn with me. They looked like shadows at first moving along the ground like dark puddles spreading outwards from a surrounding oil spill. But then the things began to take shape and rise up, shedding their two-dimensional forms and turning into humanoid beings with pitch-black features. The shadow creatures moved slowly and deliberately, their mouths yawning open as they approached me with curious faces. 
Their features were black holes within their dark forms. They reached out towards me as the chanting thing in the corner raised up its hands like a preacher in a demonic prayer service, its voice rising higher and higher in volume. Red painted walls around me began to drip and bleed, revealing ancient druidic symbols which were carved deep in the wood beneath. Suddenly the entire barn felt like a living thing, as if I was inside the belly of some great horrible beast which was inhaling and exhaling all around me. It was hot in the barn, and humid despite the chill of the night air outside. The temperature was rising quickly, causing sweat to pour from my brow, running into my eyes and making them sting with pain as the shadow creatures started to inspect me more closely. Each one took its turn leaning in close, running its oily hands over me and judging me like a prize. They made whispering noises back and forth, and took a few sample bites out of me with shadowy mouths, leaving oddly non-bleeding wounds in my flesh. I cried out in pain each time, and it seemed like they were shushing me as they raised up their extremities to my face with each noise I made. For some reason I found myself obliging, hating to think what they might do to me if I didn't listen to them. Finally, one of them seemed to settle on me, taking me for themselves, as the chatter between the shadow creatures stopped and it smiled broadly, looking pleased with itself. The creature resembled a black panther about to pounce as it leaned in towards me. It looked as if it was preparing to dive into my mouth to make a home inside my body permanently, when the huge wooden barn door, which had previously vanished, crashed in behind me. Glaring spotlights filled the space, and I looked around to see the shadow things were dispersing and disappearing. The shaman creature in the corner, who had been chanting in wicked tones, made a circular motion with its scepter, and a dark hole appeared in the wall, which he proceeded to exit through. It disappeared a second later, closing tightly behind him. Looking around, I saw the barn around me was no longer painted bright red. It was old and run down, dilapidated and out of use. The ceiling was broken and sagging, revealing stars through a gaping hole up above. There was a disused tractor in one corner old cans of paint and barrels filled with chemicals, but no shadowy creatures like there had been moments before. "'What the hell are you doing in here, kid?' one of the security guards was asking me. "'You're not supposed to be in here. Nobody's allowed in this building. It's not safe.' "'But Peter told me to check it out. He was sleeping. I—' "'I never told you to go in here. I haven't seen you since you disappeared earlier,' said Peter, stepping out from behind the other guard." You're lucky these guys came to check on you after hearing you screaming. This building's off limits. Can't you see it's ready to fall down at any second? But I was with you just ten minutes ago. You said... Don't put words in my mouth, kid. And don't make up stories. I didn't tell you anything. I turned around you were gone. I figured you went home, to be honest. Thought maybe this job wasn't for you. I stuttered, unsure of what to say or how to respond to this. I was sure Peter had told me to go to the barn to check it out, but was I remembering it wrong? Was I really that tired? Or had I been spending my shift with an imposter? A skinwalker? How was I supposed to know now what was true? Looks like we got a 278, said one of the guards nervously. The skinwalkers are back. Don't talk about them, snapped the supervisor. You know the rules. You talk about them, and that's when they show up. Everybody get inside. Now. Buddy protocols. You need to go to the bathroom, you take your buddy with you. You know the rules, Peter. We got a code black by the sounds of it. Everyone drew their weapons, and I saw these other guards had guns with odd, futuristic attachments on the barrels. Strange, translucent white pieces that looked oversized like silencers. I hadn't seen any of these people when I arrived, but for the first half of my training shift, they hadn't been here. It turned out they lived on the property and were paid handsomely to be on call to respond to any events as they occurred. These were the real security guards of Skinwalker Ranch. The ones who were called to action when the paranormal shit went down, like it was at that very moment. You guys gotta be kidding. Skinwalkers? Really? Peter asked as we hustled inside. He looked unimpressed by all that was happening, and I realized he didn't believe in anything supernatural. He was a diehard skeptic of such things. Come on, guys, he said dryly. This is complete paranoia. The kid just had a panic attack or something. You guys don't really believe in this stuff, do you? Quiet, 
One of the heavily armored guards snarled at him. You don't know shit about what happens in this place. You've only been here for a month. The boss should have known better than to let you train the new guy. He could have gotten himself killed. And that would have been on you. I felt queasy and numb all over when he said that, realizing it was true. If they hadn't arrived when they did, who knew what might have happened? Peter didn't say another word. Instead, he just made an annoyed sound and followed the rest of us in formation, moving towards the door of the farmhouse. He stayed back a little ways as if in protest. Just as we were about to enter the house, I heard him stop a few yards away, muttering to himself. I paused to look back, stopping where I was in the doorway as the rest of the team went inside. I held the door open for him, hoping he would follow, but instead he began to yell in a loud, agitated voice. You're all a bunch of suckers, you know that? Skinwalkers. Really. This place is just a busted down old ranch in the middle of nowhere. There's no curse. There's no monsters. Watch. He turned around, facing the other direction. Oh, skinwalkers. Come and get me. Look, fresh meat for you, skinwalkers. What, aren't you hungry? Looking back at us, he smiled, then started laughing mockingly at all of us. See, there's nothing out here. Just a bunch of... Huh? He made a surprised sound and turned suddenly, just as something began to appear from the shadows. It was large and hulking, its form an ink blot against the starless midnight sky. <sighs> the sound it made was like a deep growl, like a territorial wolf, only much, much larger. Its legs were long and stilted, giving it an unnatural look. Its fur was bare in places, mangy and full of clumps and burrs. Nice doggy, Peter said, backing away, his hands extended outward defensively. That's not a dog! Get inside the fucking house, now! Screamed a voice from over my shoulder, deafening me. Several other dark shapes emerged from the periphery of my vision, crowding around Peter and surrounding him. He began to run, but it was too late. They leapt at him, knocking him to the ground with a brutal impact. It looked like a highlight football tackle, his upper body being sent one direction, then his legs were slammed into from the opposite angle, causing his body to contort and bend in two different ways. When he landed, he looked unable to breathe or speak, and I wondered if the wind had been knocked out of him or if they'd broken his spine. I instinctively began to run towards him, thinking I could save him, but one of the nearby guards grabbed my arm and pulled me back. If not for that, I'd probably be dead. Squad, firing positions! The guy in charge of the group yelled, and they all fell into formation. Meanwhile, the demon wolves were tearing Peter to pieces. One of them had its jaws around his face and was squeezing like a vice grip on his skull. Another one was shredding his torso with its teeth. Ready, aim, fire! The group of pseudo-soldiers around me started unleashing semi-automatic rifle rounds into the hellhounds, each one marking a green trajectory which streaked across the sky like tracer bullets. There was no immediate reaction from the beasts at first, and I thought they were making no impact, but then the dog-like creatures began snapping and wincing at the bullets as they were grazed by them. Don't let up! Keep the pressure on! Instead of retreating, the shadow-like creatures snarled and began to stalk towards the group of us. The bullets were doing little to stop their advance, as if they were being sprayed with water pistols. It merely seemed to annoy them further. One leapt suddenly with lightning-quick speed, pouncing on a guard nearby. He screamed as the thing shredded his Kevlar, cutting through the protective gear like warm butter with its claws. Peter was no longer moving or breathing, and the remaining guards were quickly losing their courage. Fall back, the leader of the group shouted, and I hustled inside, this time not even hesitating. We slammed the door shut and listened to the screams of the guards who didn't make it back inside. The creatures didn't kill them quickly, though. They were left alive. They died slowly as the hellish wolves tortured them, making them scream for help in an attempt to draw us back outside to rescue them. After a while, I plugged my ears. Unable to stand the sounds of their dying screams one moment longer. They didn't stop until the sun came up. And by then, the creatures were gone. You'd think there would be some evidence that one of the surveillance systems would have caught something. But the cameras showed nothing the next day. I saw the tapes myself. They showed nothing but a peaceful farm until about 3.30 a.m., 
when all of them went dead at the exact same instant. Authorities investigated the incident, and I gave a statement about what I'd seen, at least as accurate of a statement as I could under the circumstances. The whole thing was written off as a wild animal attack, and once the dust settled, the whole team was let go, fired for our inaction during the event. Not that I ever wanted to go back there anyways. I'll never forget about what happened that day, and what the guards said about them showing up when you talk about them. So be careful if you hear this read aloud, because they just might have heard you speak their name. And they always show up when you talk about them. You just might not notice. Working as a border patrol agent is a scarier job than most people think, especially during late night shifts. I work in an area where there is a lot of action, including smuggling of people, guns, drugs, and other illegal material. There are cartel operators and coyotes, gangs and lone wolves, and everything in between. During these overnight shifts, I was thankful when I had the opportunity for company, even if it was in the form of a green guild trainee, and Jake was as green as they come. Quiet night tonight, he was saying, looking out the windshield desperately, hoping for someone or something to challenge our authority. So when are we going to see some action? You don't want action, kid, trust me. But before this night is done, we'll run into something. This is the witching hour. All the players come out this time of night. But what if we need to change spots? Maybe they saw us here and... Quiet, Jake. You need to keep quiet or you're going to give away our location. Nobody knows we're here, okay? If we drive away now, we're going to spook them. Just watch and learn, okay? There's a reason they put you here with me tonight. You wanted your first caller, here's where you're going to get it. I was struck by a familiar feeling of deja vu. The same scene playing out over and over again in this truck. Maybe one day it would be different. Maybe one day I'd get to retire. Jake settled down, moping in the passenger seat. The kid didn't understand the job yet. He didn't know what it was like to sit out here alone, surrounded by desert hills with no backup for miles and miles. These old cliffs and low mountains were dotted with mine shafts and tunnels, blasted out of the sand and stone long before he was born. And they afforded plenty of places to hide. There were people who wanted us dead out here in the desert, and they would be glad to have the chance to make that happen. One spot in particular caught my eye, and around the same time when Jake noticed it. Hey, do you see that light? No. Look, right up there, he said, pointing right next to my face, his index finger indicating an obvious orb of light. Nope, don't see anything. You know what, maybe, maybe we should move after all. He jerked his head down as if afraid of being spotted. They're looking right at us, I think. No, it doesn't look like they can see us. Of course not, I thought to myself. Because this is a good spot to hide, that's why I come here. How many are there? I asked, resigned to the fact that this was happening now. We were going to pursue them, or at least he was going to pursue them. Looks like two, maybe three at most. Smugglers, by the looks of it. Okay, I said. Now don't do anything stupid, just stay put, let me call it in. We'll get some backup out here. They'll be gone by the time they arrive. Come on, the two of us can stop them. He cracked open his door slowly and then got out. I had the interior lights rigged to stay dim so that it wouldn't give away our location to anyone. He closed his door as silently as he could, the soft sound of metal clicking back into place indicating he was really leaving. I just sighed, knowing how this was going to go. It always seemed to go the same way. That deja vu feeling struck again, but only for a second as I ran to catch up with the kid. Slow down, Jake. You need to stay hidden for an approach like this. We're, we're too out in the open here. He ignored me, continuing his trajectory as if I weren't even there with him. Like, I'm trying to help you. Just listen to me. You're going to get yourself killed. 
He kept marching stubbornly forward, and I saw where he was headed. One of the black holes cut out in the face of a mountain was straight ahead. An old mine shaft that had been out of use for decades. They're heading for that tunnel. We need to cut them off before they get there, he said like a character in a play who is committed to saying the lines he has rehearsed, despite the improvisations of the other cast members. His breath was growing labored. He sounded like he was getting winded already, and he hadn't even started chasing anyone yet. Adrenaline can give you a lot of strength and speed, but it doesn't last long. And when that endorphin rush is over, you're way more tired than you would normally be. That was why I tried to stay calm in situations like this. But I hadn't had time to teach him that lesson yet. We finally reached the doorway to the mine shaft after a long, long hike. The smugglers he had seen had made it there a few minutes before us, and had given no indication of noticing our path towards them. Still, I got the feeling they knew we were coming. Despite my years on Border Patrol, they knew this desert a hell of a lot better than us. Okay, what's next, boss? Jake said, looking at me as we stood outside the tunnel entrance. It's not up to me, Jake. You already made this decision for yourself. I told you we need backup. You didn't listen. Oh, come on, man. Just think about how excited everyone at the station is going to be when they see we caught these guys by ourselves. They probably got a bunch of cocaine or heroin or something. We heroes. Don't do it, kid. Please, just, just listen to me. He didn't listen. Instead, he went straight inside the tunnel, and I stupidly followed after him. We kept our flashlights off, moving towards the sound of echoing voices in the distance. It sounded like two men having a conversation. They were laughing and joking, and I could hear glasses clinking as if they were celebrating something with a toast. We got him, man, Jake whispered, his gun drawn. I could see his hands trembling, his legs wobbly with each nervous step he took going forward. The sounds of their voices grew louder as we got closer. With each step, I felt more certain of what would happen next. Like a jump scare in a horror movie, I knew it was coming, but I didn't know exactly when. But then it really did begin to play out like a movie. We rounded the corner to find two men sitting in front of a small fire. They were drinking and laughing, smoking hand-rolled cigarettes which were clenched in their yellowed fingers. Hands up! Get them up now! Border Patrol, you're both under arrest! Jake was yelling at the two men as they put their hands in the air. Cigarettes dangling from their lower lips. They didn't look particularly concerned. Under arrest for what? One of them asked in broken English. We're just camping here? You Americans have laws against camping? Jake's gun began to lower slightly, as if he was taken aback by the question. But a second later, he raised it at their heads again, as if remembering who he was and what we were doing out there. You two came across the border illegally. I saw it. Now I'm guessing by those bags you were carrying, you had something with you. Something heavy. What bags? Do you see any bags? The two men were looking at him as if he were an idiot. And Jake looked uncertain again. There was another man, Jake. You said two or three of them, remember? He didn't seem to hear me. Instead, he went towards the two men, getting within arm's reach of them both. Alarm bells began to ring in my mind as I thought about the danger he was putting himself in. And then the other man emerged from a side tunnel, his gun raised. Drop it! Jake yelled. But those were the last words from his mouth. Three loud shots rang out in the tunnel, their echoes reverberating painfully and piercing my ears until it felt like my eardrum would explode. Jake was on the ground a moment later, bleeding out. His blood was so dark in the dim light that it appeared almost black, like crude oil leaking from the floor below him. You shouldn't have come here, a voice said, and another shot rang out. I felt a hollow ache in my gut. An emptiness, where the bullet had been. I remembered falling to the floor in this exact spot where I stood now. I remember the pain of that shot, now just a distant memory. The voices of the men fleeing the tunnel were loud at first, then grew quieter as they disappeared into the distance. My heart was thumping fast as I looked down at Jake, 
the blood pouring from his mouth, dribbling down his chin as he coughed and sputtered, saying, I'm sorry, boss. I just want to listen to you. It's okay, kid. It's going to be okay. You're going to make it, I promise. You're going to see your mom again, just like I promised her this morning. I'm going to take care of you. My voice trailed off as his breathing slowed, then stopped. One more ragged, crackling inhalation could be heard as he tried desperately to fight off death. The exhale came, wet and bubbling. But nothing else after that. He was dead. I left him there. As I walked back towards the truck through the darkness of the desert, I couldn't help but lift up my shirt at the bottom, fingering the scar where the bullet had gone in. All these years later, it was still there. Like a trophy. A souvenir of something awful. The truck was up on the hill, dim and quiet. I marched towards it and got in, catching my breath as I sat down. Memories of what I had seen played out in my mind. Everything so real I could practically reach out and touch it. I just wished I could forget those memories. I wish I didn't have to relive them over and over again. I wish I didn't have to see all my mistakes and all the things I could have done better. The ways I could have saved them. Over and over again. Replaying like a movie I've seen a thousand times before. The stories of this area of the desert are plentiful. There's a lot of action that happens around here. And I don't just mean illegal border crossings. There's another border we seem to share. And the lines are blurry at this time of night between the world of the living and the world of the dead. More than one border patrol agent has told me they've seen ghosts in this exact spot. A lot of them describe the same person. A young recruit who looks eager and ready for duty. He's a bit green around the gills, but he's clearly motivated. He wants to do good. He wants to help people. I guess I'm the one who sees him the most, though. Which is fitting, since I'm the one who his mother blamed for his death. A chill ran down my spine as I felt eyes watching me from the passenger seat and saw a flash of white light appear beside me. Fear gripped me anew. Even though I like to pretend this was all normal, it didn't get any less terrifying when it happened. Still, I felt like I owed it to Jake, to give him a little taste of real life again, even if it was repetitious, like a movie being played on a loop over and over again. Usually he didn't make two visits in one night, but tonight was special. It was the anniversary, after all. And it was the witching hour. That time of night when the veil gets so thin you can see right through it. And you can reach out and touch what's on the other side sometimes. Quiet night tonight, Jake said from the seat next to me. So, when are we going to get some action? It was late at night when I pulled up outside the place, buried deep in a forest of bare white birch trees. My headlights had been off for a while, and I quieted the engine's rumble with a backwards twist of the key in the ignition. Once the car was still, I breathed a sigh of relief. No lights were turning on. No people were waking up inside the house. My prey had not noticed me yet. I opened the driver's side door of my truck, keeping the decibels low as I closed it shut behind me again. The cabin lights were rigged to stay dim, and I felt secure in the shadows by the gravel road. There were no cars along this stretch, but still I had pulled the truck far onto the grass, tucking it into the darkness of the trees. I strapped two pistols to my waist and one on my ankle, slinging the lightweight assault rifle across my back for long range. I wasn't anticipating a fight, 
but it was always good to be prepared. The moonless sky overhead provided much-needed darkness, as I stepped into the forest and began to move silently through the trees. I'd done this so many times that my feet didn't make a sound as I walked. When you've been hunting the most dangerous game in the world for twenty years, like I have, you learn to be stealthy. There's nothing worse than being caught in the act when you're trying to kill someone. And believe me, I've been there. Making my way through the last section of the forest, I considered the gunshot scars and old knife wounds which decorated my skin. Wincing, I couldn't help but remember the worst of them. A 22 millimeter to my side which had ping-ponged around my thoracic cavity, doing a multitude of damages. I tried my best not to think about how much longer I would have to do this for, how many more people I would have to kill, before I could finally rest, before I could finally retire and be free of this madness. But the people I work for will never allow that while I'm still healthy, and while I'm still in my prime. I would need a lot of money to escape permanently, and to disappear completely from their grasp. The lights up ahead broke me from my bad thoughts as I emerged from the forest and saw the target's house was very close now. Most times, a man like this would own a dog, something big and terrifying to scare away intruders. A lot of my victims seemed to sense death coming for them long before it arrived, and they prepared for this by purchasing assault rifles and claymores, pistols and grenades, pit bulls, and Doberman pinchers but my client had insisted that this man was peaceful and innocent. He was an elderly gentleman who lived alone, the anonymous voice on the phone had told me, insisting on sending the money by wire and never meeting face to face, and paying an exorbitant surcharge for the privilege of anonymity. The victim didn't have any family. He would be asleep in his bed by the time I arrived, and I would be in and out in ten minutes or less. Easy money, they said. That was the client's promise. And my own research had confirmed all of this as well. After tailing the man for a week, I was confident he was at home, in his small house, sleeping quietly alone, at this hour of the night. I was so sure of myself. I was about to pull out my lockpick kit, when I decided to try the doorknob instead. Amazingly, it turned in my hand, letting out a small, rusted squeak. The old bastard was just as trusting as they'd said. Stepping inside the old house, I took my gun from its holster and checked that the safety was off. There was one in the chamber at all times, and today was no exception. Something felt off, though. My instincts were telling me to run, for reasons I just couldn't understand. The house was too quiet, too still. I realized suddenly that there was no noise coming from the refrigerator in the kitchen, as if it had been unplugged. But why would anyone unplug their fridge? The entire house was deathly silent. Usually there would be a computer humming, a ceiling fan spinning, or a furnace blowing air through the vents. But this place was quiet as a catacomb. I told myself I was being foolish. The old man was probably an eccentric who took out his fuses overnight. Or maybe his power had been shut off by the city for non-payment. Or he lived off the grid. Whatever the case was, I had a job to do. Pressing forward, I went through the stale-smelling kitchen, past a dark entrance to the run-down living room on my right. A stained couch and a ragged recliner could be seen inside, positioned in front of a television with bent rabbit ears on top. Slowly pushing open the bedroom door, I stepped inside. There was a shape on the bed which looked like a man, but wasn't. My keen eyes immediately saw that the normal rise and fall of the chest was absent, the man's skin pale and plastic-looking. It was a dummy, I realized too late. The blank white face of it was expressionless and stared up at the ceiling as I gasped, and my heart skipped a beat in my chest. I'd been tricked. This was a trap. I had made plenty of enemies over the years, and one of them had finally found me. One with enough resources and know-how to make something like this happen. My mind raced, trying to think of who it could be. That Somali warlord's brother. The Mafia family. None of them felt right. A hissing sound began to come from all around me, 
and I noticed a mist was coming through the vents now, smelling of chemicals. I fought against it, trying desperately to stay conscious. My head began to spin as I crumpled to the floor, and the last thing I remembered was feeling as if the entire house were moving, like it had been picked up and placed on a tractor trailer, and was being driven towards the highway. And then the world became a veil of total darkness for a while, a heavy black curtain made of velvet, which rested over my eyes, and told me to sleep. I woke up on a beach, confused and nauseated, my head spinning viciously, causing me to vomit into the sand beside me. After a while, I managed to focus on a single spot in the distance long enough to get my vision to settle, and eventually stood to my feet with an effort. My eyes took in the surroundings with a sense of surreal fascination. Palm trees, tropical birds, surf and sand with jagged rocky shards breaking through the white caps. This had to be a dream. The sun was blazing in the sky overhead and the ocean was glaring at me, a headache booming in my skull like an overinflated balloon about to burst. Sand was clinging to my skin everywhere and I looked at it numbly. How the hell did I get here? I needed a vacation, but I sure as hell didn't remember going on one. But then I remembered the dummy in the bed and the gas coming from the vents. That feeling of being driven towards the highway like a pig in the back of a truck, headed for the slaughterhouse. I'd been abducted. But for what purpose? I realized my feet were hurting terribly. Worse than any pain I'd ever felt before in my life. The sand beneath me wasn't sand at all, but some sort of very finely crushed glass. My body had been numb from whatever drugs they'd fed me, and I hadn't noticed the stabbing pain in my soles until now. Suddenly I felt the agony of it digging and cutting my skin, and saw my feet were bleeding and glittering with jagged pieces of it wedged into my flesh. A sharp intake of air hissed out between my lips involuntarily, the closest sound I ever made to acknowledging pain and I reached down to brush the glass from my feet. It pierced into my fingers instead, slicing the pads with paper-fine cuts. What the hell is this place? I asked no one in particular, as I began to stumble from the beach towards the trees, off balance from whatever I'd been gassed with. As if to answer my question, an enormous semi-transparent dome appeared overhead, encompassing the island and that a face filled the sky, blocking out the clouds and the sun. Like a deity, it was a thousand feet tall, and it took me a few moments to take it all in. It was a man with gray hair and a friendly smile. Hello, and welcome to the island, he said kindly. My apologies for taking you all from your busy schedules, but I'm sure you'll be very glad I did, once I explain... It is my great pleasure to inform you all that you have been chosen for a very special event. Consider it the World Cup of Professional Killing, or as I like to call it, the deadliest game. He paused for a few seconds as if he had made a joke and were waiting for someone to laugh, but then he scowled and continued. Each of you has been selected because of your particular skill set. That skill set is murder. There are twenty of you on this island. I have looked into your backgrounds extensively, and I understand you are the very best of the best of the best at what you do. Killing people. This made me pause as I realized suddenly that I was not alone. This psychopath kidnapped a bunch of people and dropped us all on a private island. I looked around, trying to spot another person, but could see no one. It occurred to me that if I did spot someone, they might not be friendly. Twenty murderers were placed on this island, after all. Not ordinary people. The man had just said it himself. I suddenly felt very exposed on the beach and began to run towards cover. There was a forest further inland, and I sprinted towards it, wincing at the pain in my feet with each step, driving the broken glass in further and further. There was a sound of running water up ahead and I moved in that direction, thinking I could use the water to rinse the glass from my feet. Jackson Triggs, the man announced overhead, continuing his speech. 
and his face disappeared, showing another man's profile picture. Navy SEAL Squad 6 Unit Commander. Trained sniper and close quarters combat expert. Survivalist and Iron Man competitor during his off time. My money is on you, Mr. Triggs. But some others are betting greedily against the favorite. So be careful. You never know when one of your rivals might receive a gift from one of their benefactors. You gotta be kidding me, I thought to myself. What the hell is this now? The fucking Hunger Games? Benefactors? Gifts? Rivals? Was Jennifer Lawrence gonna pop out of the trees and shoot me with a bow and arrow? Fuck! The image in the sky changed again to reveal a woman with a stern, determined look on her face. She was dressed in a military uniform that I recognized as belonging to the Green Berets. The man's voice began describing her training in battle history in horrifying detail, and I realized I was in serious trouble. These people were no joke. Even if this whole thing felt like a bad YA novel. One by one, he described my fellow combatants until reaching my name at the end. He described me with a few cursory sentences, making me feel small compared to my competition. It struck me that I was the underdog in the deadliest game, not the favorite. And most people, if not all, would be betting against me. None of them granting me gifts or favors. There is only one rule for all of you participating in my little game, the man in the sky continued. The last person alive gets to leave. You will also receive a handsome reward for your efforts. Enough money so that you will never have to work again in your life. One hundred million dollars. My legs froze mid-stride. I had been walking deeper into the jungle when I heard those words and stopped. Was he serious? A hundred million dollars? People in my line of work frequently kill for far less than that. Oh, and one more thing, the man's voice said from all around, like thunder booming in the sky. The perimeters of my playground will begin to shrink in exactly one hour. By how much, you'll just have to wait and see. The point is, you better not find yourself on the wrong side of the playground fence, or you'll be punished quite severely. That is to say, you'll be killed by drones with Sidewinder missiles. Ta-ta! Have fun, children. And don't be tardy. I started running. Despite the fact that my shoes had been taken and I was walking on what felt like shards of broken glass, I had to move quickly. Every time I stepped on a branch or a rock, I felt a lightning bolt of pain shoot up through the bottom of my feet. A few times I tried to stop in order to dig the glass out, but was unable to alleviate the pain, and only injured myself further. Finally, I heard the sound of running water very close from up ahead, and realized it was a stream. Approaching it carefully, I sat on a rock at the edge and washed my feet, arms, and legs, which were all covered with the glass-sand mixture. The water turned pink and then red with my blood, as I saw a million tiny cuts had been left behind by the jagged shards, the wound edges flapping in the water like fish gills as they were rinsed clean. Then... A small box with a red ribbon tied around it entered my field of vision. It was floating lazily down the stream towards me, bobbing up and down as it bounced against rocks and tumbled down each little waterfall it came across. When it got in front of me, I reached down and picked it up. There was a tag hanging from the top of it which read, Best Wishes, Your Benefactor. I unwrapped the ribbon which was tied around the box and stuffed it into my pocket to avoid leaving any tracks. When I lifted the lid to look inside, I saw there were a few items. A knife in a leather sheath, a canteen, a roll of gauze, and a pair of running shoes. Thirteen and a half wide. Exactly my size. Something caught my attention up on a tree to my left, as I wrapped the gauze around the wounds on my soles and put the shoes on my aching feet. I realized it was a blue jay. And this wasn't an ordinary blue jay. It was just watching me carefully, keeping its head perfectly still, its one eye trained upon me. It looked slightly hollow and glassy, that eye, like a camera. A whirring sound came from its neck as it craned its head to observe me. More Hunger Games bullshit, I muttered. 
They were watching me from all around. Every angle was covered like a reality TV show. And I suddenly realized that, that was exactly what this was. I was a contestant in a very expensive private game show run by the world's richest psychopaths. And I got the feeling this benefactor of mine wasn't just helping me out of the kindness of his heart. I recalled what the man in the sky had said. The words and their meaning delayed due to the adrenaline rush of everything happening. My money is on you, Mr. Triggs. But some others are betting against the favorite, so be careful. It dawned on me that considering the amount of prize money this game we were involved in was likely a betting sport for a cadre of the world's wealthiest elites. I couldn't prove it, of course, but it made sense. Being involved with the sort of people I work with, I'd heard rumors of such events, but I'd always dismissed them as paranoid fantasies. Now I knew it was true. There really was a world championship of assassination, and I was the underdog in the newest class of 20 contestants. With that thought in mind, I strapped the knife to my belt and started moving. Keeping my head low, I crossed the narrow creek bed and made my way deeper into the unknown forest, preparing myself mentally for the fight of my life. The host of this twisted reality show had told us that the boundaries of the battlefield would shrink every hour, and that anyone caught outside of them would be killed by drones. That prompted me to move quickly, continuing on a line straight towards the heart of the island but I guessed that everyone else would be doing the same thing. It was our only chance at survival, after all. Like a real-life game of Fortnite. We had to stay inside the bubble or we'd get popped. Psst. I heard a whisper coming from nearby and pulled out my knife, getting ready to thrust it into someone's jugular if necessary. Hold on, cowboy. Where'd you get that nasty-looking blade? Hey, I surrender. You got me beat. A scrawny guy with a short, scruffy beard hopped down from a nearby tree branch where he'd been hiding. His clothing was covered in branches, mud, and leaves, and he'd been invisible to my eyes even after I'd heard him speak. I'd never seen anyone with such amazing camouflage abilities. He came forward to shake my hand and I backed away slightly, turning my body in a defensive posture. My fist was gripping the knife very tightly, and he looked down at it, his eyes nervous for the first time. Oh, sorry he said, raising his hands in the air as if I were pointing a gun at him. Didn't mean to startle you, it's just... He looked around nervously. This is crazy, right? I mean, this dude kidnaps us and expects us to kill each other just because he says so? Fucking rich people, man. Despite his unassuming nature, I was still suspicious. Hundred million dollars is a lot of money, I said. That kind of cash makes people do some stupid shit. Like killing each other. Trust me, I've seen it done for a lot less. He raised one eyebrow, then smirked. Aw, oh, shit. You're that contract killer, ain't you? I saw your face up there, but man, when there's 20 of the baddest motherfuckers on the planet up there, you kind of get lost in the mix. No offense. I'm sure you've seen plenty of action. How many bodies you buried? I didn't say anything. Instead, I continued walking towards the center of the island, leaving him behind. There was no time for talking, and if he wasn't going to make a move, neither was I. What? Ain't you going to kill me? Why bother? Somebody else will do it. He laughed, and I heard the faint sound of clothing as it rustled and shifted, and I knew he was reaching for something. Yeah, you're probably right about that. Bunch of stone-cold killers on this island. We're all going to get ours sooner or later. Except... For one of us, that is. I spun with the knife blade in my hand, pinched between my thumb and forefinger. As he squinted one eye shut and began to squeeze the trigger of the gun he was holding, I was already letting go of the knife, sending it sailing through the air. It landed hilt deep in his eye socket with a wet thunk sound. The point of the knife blade disappeared into his skull as his left eye opened wider in surprise. Then he fell limply to the ground, not even getting one shot off. Poor bastard. Nobody wants to be the first one voted out in a reality show. It's humiliating. I wandered over to the body, bending over to pick up the gun. A compact Glock 19 with a 33 round magazine. Then I pulled the knife free from the man's skull with an effort and wiped the blade clean on my pant leg. Oh, look at that. 
boomed a voice in the sky, and I realized it was the host of this twisted game. We just had our first encounter, ladies and gentlemen, and what a doozy it was. Congratulations to our underdog. I wasn't expecting that, I'll be honest. But you've got a long way to go. Nineteen of you remain in the game. Good luck. It didn't really hit me for a few more minutes how close I'd just been to dying. If my knife hadn't hit its mark, or if I'd been a millisecond slower, I would have wound up with a bullet through my skull. I wasn't just dealing with unsuspecting victims anymore. Now I was competing with the best of the best. Trained soldiers, commandos, and assassins more deadly than anything the world had seen before. After searching the body and finding nothing else of consequence, I moved on. Heading deeper into the forest, I saw something up ahead that looked like a building in the distance. Rain clouds were moving in, and thunder and lightning could be heard with it. And I decided to seek shelter there. But others would be heading that way as well. I had a funny feeling about it. That was just something I would have to deal with. Time is up, everyone, the host of the deadliest game called out from all around. I looked up to see his face in the sky through the tree branches where dead-eyed blue jays sat watching. Better get to where you're going quickly. The boundaries are shrinking, and you don't want to be left outside in the rain. Trust me, it's nasty stuff. A few drops began to splatter and fall on my arms, and I felt them burning where they struck my skin. Each raindrop hissed like acid, and I watched with horror as my flesh began to sizzle. Acid rain. Classic. What a sociopath. I ran even faster, getting closer to the building in the distance and seeing that it was a massive tower which rose up high into the sky. At its center was a pillar which looked to contain further floors of a skyscraper, the likes of which I had never seen before. It was like a mountain constructed of steel and glass. It dominated the skyline as I emerged into the wide clearing from the forest. My head craned up to take in the impossible height of the structure. Built out here on this island in the middle of nowhere, but looking like it belonged in a metropolis like New York or Chicago. There was suddenly a loud noise like machine gun fire in the distance, from more than one source, at least two or three if not more, and then a loud piercing boom silenced them one by one as a sniper with a bolt-action rifle took them out. It sounded like he was a very good shot, whoever he was. Eighteen, seventeen, sixteen! Bravo, sir, bravo! called the baritone voice from the sky with giddy enthusiasm. Acid rain was now pouring down from above as I ran out from the forest. I stayed close to the trees which grew outside of its boundaries. My path was serpentine and I kept my head low, leaving myself exposed as little as possible as the tower got closer. But it was still so far away. I hadn't realized how massive the building was at first, and like a mountain in the distance it was taking a long while to get to it. I looked back to see that coming from behind was the inner wall of a massive blue-tinged dome, shrinking and growing smaller by the second. If I ended up on the other side of that dome, drones from the sky would shoot me dead in an instant. Not only that, but I had other matters to worry about too. Every second I remained exposed was another opportunity for that sniper to catch me with a bullet, and for the acid rain to melt my flesh. I saw my skin was drooping and sagging in places, like melted candle wax, and guessed that my face looked the same. I would be a hideous, disgusting creature by the time I escaped the island at this rate, assuming I ever actually managed to escape. A sound like a bee zipping past my ear made me jump as I felt blood trickle down my cheek a moment later. Fuck. The sniper. He had me in his sights. I had no choice but to dive quickly behind a large patch of foliage. Once there, I hunkered down behind a tree and waited, watching as my clothes sizzled and the acid rain scorched my flesh. Another bullet impacted the tree and the sound of a gunshot in the distance could be heard a moment later. Judging by the brief delay, it meant the shooter wasn't far away. I could make a run for it, but it would be risky. But then I realized I didn't need to make a run for it. All I had to do was wait. The dome was getting smaller by the second, and it looked like the tower was at its center, which meant everyone would be going in that direction, and the sniper would have to head that way as well. It was only a matter of time. I waited and listened as shots rang out one by one, 
and my competition fell dead from the sniper's bullets. He had found a good spot, whoever he was. He liked to camp, and he wasn't moving. Fifteen, fourteen, thirteen, twelve! The voice of the sadistic host called out each death like a lottery number. Finally, the dome was so close I could hear the buzzing electric sound of it, narrowing the gap inch by inch. On the other side, I saw a man running towards me until he was vaporized in an instant, blown to pieces by a missile which flew down from the sky above. Eleven! I was about as far as I was willing to push it. I got up and began to run, hearing the static hiss of the translucent blue dome closing in behind me as I bolted through the clearing. The sniper had given up his spot as well, I realized, and saw he was now running the same direction as I was, about a hundred yards away from me. The two of us were running for our lives, stealing nervous glances at each other occasionally as if sizing each other up. But there was no time to stop and kill one another, as the blue dome was closing in fast. It was at my heels as I ran at full tilt, sprinting through the pain of a stitch in my side, as it grew into a terrible cramp in my belly that begged me to stop. I gripped my teeth and stared at my feet as I ran, begging them to continue knowing what would happen if I let up my pace for even an instant. The blue dome's hiss of static could be heard so close now it was like a mosquito buzzing in my ear, tickling the back of my neck as it got ready to overtake me. It felt unpleasant and wrong when the blue holographic projection hit my skin, as if a low voltage of electricity were being carried through it. Up ahead I saw we were headed for a steep drop-off. Not quite a cliff, but not quite a ditch, it appeared that we would be falling more than 10 or 15 feet towards a rocky embankment if we didn't slow down, and neither one of us was about to slow down. We both ran off the ledge at full speed, just as the dome stopped closing in. The blue wall of light froze at the top of the ledge as we tumbled down the slope, pinwheeling and crashing into boulders and rocks. Hitting my head, I felt a lightning bolt of pain go through my skull before the entire world went black and fell away completely. I woke up a few minutes later, realizing with horror that I had been knocked unconscious during the fall. But to my great surprise, the sniper was gone. He had not taken the opportunity to kill me, and neither had anyone else. Maybe he didn't want to kill an unconscious man just to prove he's better than me, I thought to myself bitterly. To prove he has honor. What a douchebag. It was ironic, since I wound up in this place due to the fact that I was prepared to kill an old man in his sleep for money. And I'd been doing such things for a long, long time. Maybe I needed to re-examine my life. Maybe I really did need to retire. Before I lost what was left of my soul. That thought was occurring to me more and more frequently lately. Struggling to my feet, I looked around and saw there was nobody nearby. My destination stood clearly in the distance even more obvious now that the blue dome had shrunk so significantly. That structure was at the very center of this place, it was plain to see. Everyone would be headed there, and whoever was left alive would be the best of the best. I wasn't out of danger yet. Not by a long shot. The next section of the island was full of small boulders and rocks and a meandering series of streams and creeks which fed outwards from the heart of the island. The impression I got was that the center of the island had once been a great mountain, but it had been hollowed out and blasted with dynamite until it was only a fraction of its size. The pieces of granite and rock which had once comprised the Goliath, now repurposed to create the monstrous skyscraper which towered over everything. Who would be capable of something like that? It was like something Lex Luthor or Dr. Evil would do. Some sort of James Bond villain of unrealistic proportions. Before I could give it any more thought, the sound of approaching footsteps broke me from my observations. I spun around just in time to see a woman with a spear running towards me, the sharp end of the thing sticking out in my direction, ready to impale me. She began to howl a war cry of some sort when she saw me notice her, and picked up her pace even more. I saw she had dark mud spread on her face like war paint, streaks beneath her eyes and vertical lines running down her cheeks. Luckily, she was still a good ten yards away, so I drew my pistol and had it pointed at her face a second later. Normally, that would have been that. I would have squeezed the trigger and she would have been dead. But I paused, 
For a split second, I hesitated. I don't really know why. Maybe it was that asshole sniper. The fact that he hadn't killed me was really sticking in my craw. Did he think he was better than me? Was that it? But that was enough time for the woman to throw her spear at me. The tip of its blade went directly into the barrel of my gun, bullseye, sending it flying backwards at my hand and really fucking up my index finger in the process, since it was stuck in the trigger guard. The pistol leapt from my grip and crashed into a rock nearby, completely and utterly destroyed by the pressure of the impact against the boulder. And then the woman was on me. Her face was full of rage as spittle flew from her mouth and she hissed and punched me, trying to get her legs around my neck in a chokehold of some sort. She quickly managed to do so and I heard myself making gurgling, strangled noises as she squeezed tighter and tighter, my head trapped between her thighs. The world started fading to black as I considered my options. You know, I could split it with you, I gasped. The prize money, 50-50. She didn't look convinced. Maybe it was the fact that my face was turning purple and she had the upper hand. I managed to surprise her with a quick move and ended up on top of her. My forearm was down on her neck and I heard her gasping for air, although her thighs were still wrapped around my neck in a triangle choke from below. I realized for the first time that the woman was beautiful. Her black hair flecked with dirt, her lips and teeth stained red with blood, the slightest hint of a rosy hue playing on her cheeks, although that might have been due to lack of oxygen. Fifty million is still a lot of money, she squeezed through her strangled trachea as I continued cutting off her air supply. It is. I managed to cough through my own narrowed windpipe. Does that offer still stand? 50-50? She asked, releasing the pressure on my neck slightly. I let up on her neck, and she breathed in a raspy intake of air. Yeah, you got it, I said, letting go completely. She did the same. Thanks, she said, panting. I'm Tia. Tia Trebell. It took me a few seconds to get my wind back, but when I did, I couldn't help but gush. What can I say? I'm a fan. Holy shit, Tia the Terrible? You're fucking famous. Didn't you kill that Al-Qaeda dude? The general, right? She looked surprised. You know about that? Damn, nothing stays classified anymore, does it? Well, if you know about it, I didn't think what those pricks are going to do when they find out. Maybe I'm better off dead on this island. Hey, I got better sources than most foreign intelligence agencies. Trust me, you're good. I'm just better. Cocky, too, I see. Well, you don't really become the number one hitman in the world by being meek. It doesn't really translate in this business. I helped her up to her feet, and we both looked at each other for a second, then back up at the tower in the distance. 50-50, right? She said nervously. 50-50. The two of us walked for a while, and eventually the tower began to look a little bit closer. I could make out the details of its entrance and saw there was only one big door with arrows pointing to it from every direction, like a department store advertising a big sale. I knew a trap when I saw one. Hurry up, children. Round two is almost finished, the host called from the sky, his grinning face appearing to leer down at us once again. Only three of you left, and if you don't want to die, you'd better get inside. There had been several loud gunshots which we'd heard as we walked towards the tower, each time ducking down instinctively at the sound of it. But none of the bullets were destined for us. Each one of them found its mark, though, as the countdown of dead bodies continued being announced from above. Now we had other concerns, as the blue force field dome surrounding us was shrinking again. The past hour had gone by quickly, and we were once again in danger of not making it into the new safe zone. The two of us ran as fast as we could as the static buzz of electricity grew louder in our ears once again. We're not going to make it, Tia shouted, looking back at the wall of blue closing in. The tower was still a ways off, and it would definitely be close. Once again, I saw the sniper was keeping pace, running parallel with us towards the entrance of the tower. I knew if he arrived first, he would have the upper hand. We needed to beat him there. We'll make it. I said back, with more confidence than I felt. But we got company. Tia looked over and saw the sniper, Triggs, and her eyes widened. Oh shit, you know who that is, right? Yeah, Triggs, the favorite. 
Come on, gutted it. We gotta get there first. Tia threw on the afterburners as her face turned into a grimace of pain. She pumped her legs up and down forcefully as she ran, now outpacing me and making me look like an amateur next to an Olympic sprinter. You mean like this? She asked, looking back and gritting a smile at me through her teeth. Shit, I muttered, trying to run faster to catch up. Instead, she just gained more of a lead. Putting my head down again, staring at my feet, I ran until my legs burned and my belly was a cramp from top to bottom. And just as the blue wall of the dome was about to overtake me, I dove inside the open front door of the tower, surprised at how close it was now. Tia was inside a moment before me, and the sniper had gotten there 30 seconds prior to her, running like Usain Bolt at the last second. Once again, I was caught off guard. Triggs was gone. There was no sign of him. It was just me and Tia staring down a long, dark hallway which led into a white light. Holy shit, that dude's fast. So are you. You ready? I asked, looking at her. I was surprised to see she was scared. And I realized I was terrified. I don't know. I have a really bad feeling about this. I've worked with Triggs. I can't beat him on my own. I tried to calm my nerves and speak without sounding as nervous as I felt. Together we can stop him. The two of us. We've got this. 50-50. If you say so. Come on, let's kill this guy and get off this island. When we get back to civilization, I'll buy you a drink. She nodded but didn't say anything, and didn't look any more confident as we began to walk down the long tunnel into the light. We emerged from the dark tunnel into a crowded stadium, lights glaring down at us from above. A crowd roared and rose to their feet all around, the sound of their applause deafening. Please welcome our top three contestants, a voice boomed, and I looked up to see a giant screen mounted to one wall. The smiling face of the gray-haired host was looking down at us. But there can only be one winner, and I know who my money's on. A second later, there was a loud crack of a sniper rifle going off, and I heard the shot whiz past my face. Triggs! 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 The crowd screamed. For a moment I was relieved, thinking maybe the world-famous sniper wasn't as good as he thought. His shot had missed. But then I heard the gurgling sounds from behind me and realized he hadn't missed. He just hadn't been aiming for me. I was the underdog. He was aiming for Tia. I spun around to see her clutching her throat, a fountain of blood spurting from a hole in her neck. Her face turned pale as she gagged and coughed then reached out to take my hand in her own blood-stained grip. Then hers slipped away and she fell to the floor, lifeless and dead. And I looked up to see the glint of a sniper scope, reflecting the light, trained on me and ready to fire. As soon as I saw that reflection bouncing off the lens of the rifle scope, I dropped to the ground and lay prone on my belly. I did it without thinking. The death of my only friend in this game more than enough proof of what would happen if I delayed. My instinct saved my life. And not for the first time, as the bullet whizzed over my head a millisecond after dropping down. I actually felt it whistle through my hair like a very narrow breeze. Two contestants left! Wow, that was almost the finest double kill we've ever seen! Give it up for our finalists, ladies and gentlemen. The Great Triggs and, uh, that other guy. The crowd erupted in applause, and I lay on the floor, terrified out of my mind. Blood was spreading from Tia's head and was touching my hand, creeping towards my face. That decided it for me. I couldn't stay there one moment longer. I needed to move. It's hopeless, a voice in my mind said. The world's deadliest sniper with a bolt-action rifle in his hands against an assassin with a knife and a canteen. Not only that, but losing Tia had affected me more than I thought possible. I had imagined us leaving this place together as winners, sailing off on a private yacht and retiring from homicide together. I had pictured us on a beach, drinking mimosas and laughing, reminiscing about the old days and that time we'd been caught on that killer island and almost died. But now, it was just me again. And I was alone. Just like I always had been and just like I always would be. $100 million will buy you a lot of friends, another voice in my mind said. 
the counterpoint of the previous one. A hundred million dollars will buy you all the friends in the world. But they won't be real friends. You know that, said the twin voice, the sensible, no-nonsense one. So, what do we do? A third voice asked, and I realized I was either completely losing my mind or I was as sharp as I'd ever been. I would decided to believe it was the latter. We do what we've always done, all three voices said in unison. We kill or we get killed. This whole time I had been instinctively moving towards the spot where I'd seen the reflection on Trigg's rifle scope. He had beat us to the tower, and he had staked out a prime spot for camping once again. But every soldier has a weakness. And my talent, I've come to realize over the years, is in finding those weaknesses and exploiting them. Trigg's weakness was that he knew he was the best. Even the host had said it on numerous occasions. My money is on you, Mr. Triggs, he'd announced from the beginning. Triggs knew he was the best, and he believed it so strongly that he stopped thinking anyone else could beat him. When he'd left me unconscious at the base of the cliff where he'd fallen, it wasn't because he was a good sport. It wasn't because he had honor. No. It was because he had such little respect for my abilities. He thought I was beneath him. He wanted to kill me when I was standing up, when I was fighting back. Not because that was the right thing to do, but because he wanted to showboat. To save me for last. Now, with a hundred million dollars on the line, he thought so little of me, that even after killing my friend and taking a shot at me, he'd stayed in the same spot, believing me incapable of finding him, thinking I wouldn't see the reflection of his rifle scope. Triggs got cocky and stayed right where he was, believing himself invincible. I actually felt a little guilty for the guy, as I crept up on him, silent as a wolf stalking a rabbit in the forest, and slipped the knife under his chin just as he gasped and began to turn. But it was too late. Blood spurted and sprayed, staining his well-oiled rifle red. They don't call me the best assassin in the world for nothing and Triggs had vastly underestimated me. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a new champion, the host announced loudly. But there was no applause, only shocked silence, and then a lot of very loud boos. You really caught them off guard out there, the host said from behind his desk. We were up in his office on the very top floor of the tower, after an extremely long and unpleasant elevator ride, during which my ears had popped so violently I'd almost thrown up. I was still chewing the stick of gum the guards had offered me to help alleviate the pressure. It was the only thing that had gotten me through it. They weren't expecting the underdog to win it all, that's for sure. He stood up and looked out the window, resting his hands on the ledge in front of it. I took in his office, the walls stark white and gleaming. The view was incredible. I had to give him that. It looked out over the entire island, now missing the blue dome which I had become so accustomed to. Past the jungle and beaches, I could see water, and a giant yacht which looked to be heading towards a dock. I knew you were going to win from the beginning. That's why I put my money on you. This caught me off guard. I thought you were betting on Triggs. You said so yourself. He turned to look at me and smiled. Triggs was getting far too cocky. He thought he was untouchable. And that's when someone like you always comes to knock the knight from his horse. So, you gave me the... Yes. I'm the one who gave you the knife and the bandages, the canteen and the shoes... I'm your benefactor. Why not give me a gun and some body armor, jackass? Well, I knew you'd do your best if you were given a challenge. If you were underestimated. I've been watching you for a long time, after all. I know you better than you know yourself by this point. That really pissed me off. And suddenly I wanted more than anything to prove him wrong. I stood up and began to race towards him, 
intent on strangling the bastard to death with my bare hands, just to prove he didn't know me as well as he thought he did. But halfway there, my legs gave out, and I collapsed, my eyelids growing heavy and my face feeling numb. How's that gum tasting, champ? It's a little concoction I like to call spearmint sedative. Pops the ears on the elevator ride and sends you straight to sleep. Just as your urge to kill begins to rise again. Ta-ta. See you next year. I woke up back in my apartment. In my bed. A pounding headache filling the space between my ears with pressure and pain. A hundred million dollars now sat inside my bank account. Untraceable. There was no reason for me to ever need to kill again now. I was set for the rest of my life. I could live comfortably and never have to take another contract. But I wasn't going to get off that easy. A letter was sitting on my coffee table, which I found right after seeing my bank account balance. I opened up the envelope and read the handwritten note inside, which promptly burst into flames after I had finished reading it, like a letter from the devil. The deadliest game will resume next year at the same date and time. Be prepared to defend your title, as you will be expected to compete once again. Congratulations, new champion. See you next year. The story you just heard was written by me, and a variation of it previously featured on the Dr. No Sleep podcast and YouTube channel. If you'd like to check out their channel for more content, please check out the description below. Well, that's the last of it, I said, breathing a sigh and collapsing on the couch. I am officially toast. I just finished hauling the last couple of boxes into the house from the moving truck. Stacks of them were piled throughout the living room making a corrugated fortress around me. Unpacking would be another long adventure, but at least we had finally gotten all of our belongings into the farmhouse, so that we could begin the process of starting our new life here. As I lay on the couch, relaxing momentarily, the hairs began to stand up on the back of my neck. I started to get a strong sense that I was being watched. Specifically, from the door beneath the stairs leading to the basement, it creaked open slowly, just a crack, as I observed it back. I closed my eyes, ignoring that paranoid feeling. There was no one else in the house except for us. Therefore, nobody was watching me, it was just my imagination. Yet still, every time I turned away I felt a tingling and saw a vague shadow in that direction, just barely visible in my peripherals. There was also a feeling of presence that I could not ignore. The door to the basement yawned open wider as if inviting me in. Darkness peered out blacker than a midnight graveyard. Standing up on shaking legs, I began to walk over to that door, thinking a draft from the basement was blowing it open. I didn't like the feeling of it being ajar. Don't ask me why, but I just didn't like it. As I drew closer, the sensation of eyes watching me became more powerful, as if I was drawing closer to a predator, and my body was telling me to turn away and run. That darkness was too much for me to look at, so I turned my eyes away briefly, but that made the feeling even worse. I couldn't help thinking that if something jumped out from that doorway, I wouldn't see it until it was too late. So I looked back again, forcing myself to focus my attention on the eerie blackness. When I returned my gaze to the doorway, I could have sworn I saw eyes looking at me from the darkness for a brief instant. So quick it could have just been passed off as a trick of the light, but it made my heart skip a beat nonetheless. I slammed the door shut so hard it shook the house, and my wife yelled at me to be more gentle with the old place. Heading into the kitchen, my heart was thumping in my chest, and I told Christine what had happened. What do you mean you saw eyes down there? There was somebody in the basement? We need to call the cops. Hang on, hang on. I was trying to decide if it was my overtired brain imagining things. I thought I'd seen something, but the more I considered it, the less likely it seemed. It could have just been my eyes playing tricks on me. 
I'll grab a flashlight and take a look. No, you can't. It's too dangerous. Look, the place was locked up, right? So it couldn't have been a person down there. I was probably just imagining things. But I'll take a look just to be safe. Are you sure about this? Maybe we should call the police and have them check it out. It'll take about an hour just to get here. We're not in the city anymore, remember? Besides, there's no way anybody could have gotten in here since the owners left. Not unless they had a key. Just let me take a look, okay? Christine reluctantly agreed and took out her phone, dialing 911 and getting ready to hit send in case anything happened. I found a flashlight in one of the boxes marked camping and opened the basement door. Taking a deep, shuddering breath, I began to descend. Proceeding down the rickety steps, the beam of light showed multitudes of dust motes and particles floating in the air, being kicked up by my movements. Ancient wooden stairs creaked beneath my feet with each step I took, going down and down, deeper beneath the earth. As I did, that feeling returned again, that sensation of something watching me. That unpleasant feeling began to grow and blossom into the worst fear I'd ever experienced in my life as I set my foot down onto the dirt-packed floor of the lower level. The old farmhouse had an ancient relic of a basement, I realized. Since we had moved from a long ways away, we hadn't seen the place in person. This was the first time I'd been down there. The owners had chosen not to include pictures of the basement in their ad, and I was beginning to understand why. Shining my light around, I saw there were old pieces of leather and ragged strips of wire, rope, and twine hanging from the ceiling's crossbeams. Crude wooden crosses assembled from broken sticks and small logs hung suspended from these, turning and swaying gently despite the lack of breeze down in the basement. I felt a presence behind me suddenly and spun around, the air turning ice cold. For a moment I thought I saw a dark shadow shape similar to a person, but there was no one standing there. Every part of me wanted to get out of there, but I knew I had to make sure the basement was empty. I shone my flashlight into every corner and every hidden space, making sure it was unoccupied. Sure enough, it was. But I did find something. There was a black box in a stone alcove, surrounded by inscriptions carved directly into the foundations of the house. The strange shrine resembled something from a church or a temple, but it appeared darker somehow. Evil. A chill ran through my bones, which seemed to emanate from the stone. Unlit candles and strange black statues surrounded the box, sitting dead center in the focal piece of this creepy, unholy altar. I don't remember taking the box upstairs with me, but nonetheless I found myself back on the main level, holding it in my hands. It looked curious and ancient. The feeling of someone watching remained, accompanied by an odd chill which ran through my bones, almost like the temperature in the house had gone down by ten degrees. There's nobody down there, I told Christine, who was waiting for me at the top of the stairs. But I found this weird box, and there's all these crosses hanging from the ceiling. Tray creepy. You need to get rid of that thing, she said, holding up her hands to cover her eyes from even looking at it. I hate it. There's something wrong with it. Really? What do you want me to do with it? I asked. It's just some old box, probably somebody's keepsakes. I don't care, just put it outside, send it away with the trash on pickup day. Just get rid of it. Christine never acted this way. She didn't believe in superstition or curses. She was a self-proclaimed atheist, in fact. But the way she was acting was enough to convince me she was serious, so I didn't argue. Okay, I'll put it outside, I said. I brought it out with me into the front yard and tried to decide where to put it. I settled on leaving it in the back of the moving truck. In the glow of the lights inside the box of the moving van, I took a moment to take a closer look at the box. It was ice cold to the touch, I realized. The surface of it was slick and black like polished marble, but when I took my hand away, it smudged off like charcoal. There were archaic symbols carved into it and a lock held it shut at the front. I found myself trying to open it, but was unable to. Distantly, I heard something whispering to me, its voice insistent and raspy, but I dismissed that as just the wind and nothing more. Eventually, I gave up on the box's lock and went inside. My wife looked startled when I walked in the front door. What were you doing out there? I thought you'd gone to bed. You were out there with that creepy box for like two hours. 
No. I started to disagree with her, but then I looked at my watch and realized she was right. Unsure what to say, I told her I was tired and must have zoned out. I needed to get some sleep. Trudging up the stairs to the bedroom, I collapsed on the unmade mattress and drifted off into a deep slumber. As I slept, my dreams were filled with that dark feeling of being observed, as if eyes were watching me closely from the corner of my bedroom in the shadows. When I awoke, it was still dark outside. I looked around the pitch-black room, feeling uneasy, and saw unfamiliar shapes and shadows I didn't recognize. That sensation of being watched had returned tenfold, and I felt a presence observing me from the corner, where a man-shaped shadow stood. Running over to the door, I went to turn on the light switch. I flicked it to the on position, but the light didn't turn on, and the room remained stubbornly dark. My heart was pounding as I felt that presence staring at me in the room from the corner. I wanted more than anything to turn on the lights, but they wouldn't go on. For some reason, I found myself going back to bed instead of fleeing the room, terrified as I was. I found myself lying back down in bed and tucking myself back in under the covers and staring at the thing in the corner as it watched me. That dark, unrecognizable shape in the corner of the room began to move towards me, the shadow shape of a person reaching out for me, coming for me. I tried to move, but found myself paralyzed. I tried to scream, but couldn't. I woke up panting, covered in cold sweat, and realized I'd dreamt the whole thing. The shape in the corner of the room had revealed itself in the morning light, and I saw it was, in fact, a stack of boxes with coats draped over top of it. It was barely sunrise outside, and Christine was in the bed next to me. She bolted upright, looking startled, and asked what had happened. I had a horrible dream. It felt so real. You know those waking nightmares when you feel like you're up and walking around after being asleep, and then you realize that you were out the whole time? My wife didn't answer. Her eyes were fixed on something across the room. She was looking at the dresser, and her jaw was hanging down. What is that thing doing in here? I told you to get rid of it. You brought it up here and opened it instead? She was pointing at something, and I followed her gaze to see the black box from the basement was on the bureau. But it was open. And I had no memory of doing that. What the hell? I didn't do that. I definitely didn't open it, did I? You're telling me you don't remember bringing that box in here and opening it? No, it, it was locked. I tried. I couldn't get it open. Just get it out of here. I don't want to look at it anymore, okay? Bring it to the dump or something. Just get it out of the house and far away from here. I went over to the dresser and saw the open box was filled with strange items. A lock of hair, a charred piece of clothing, a cross, and other burnt items. There was a powerful odor coming from it as well, unlike anything I'd ever come across. The stench was unpleasant and burnt my nostrils as I drew closer. This is impossible. I know I didn't bring this in here. It's cursed or something. Just get it out of the house, please. My wife was more upset than I'd ever seen her, so I put on my clothes and took the box out to the car with me. I didn't know where the local dump was exactly, but I figured I would go look for it. As I neared the town, I saw an antique shop at the side of the road and pulled over on a whim. I wondered if the owner would be interested in taking the box off my hands, or if he could at least tell me what it was. The bell above the door rang as I entered, and a man came out from the back room, polishing a brass candelabra with a rag. Good morning, he said in a friendly voice. How can I help you? Oh. He stopped speaking abruptly when he saw what was in my hands. The candelabra fell to the floor with a loud clang, and he began to visibly shake as he raised his finger to point at the box. Do you, do you recognize this? I asked. Where did you find that thing? Uh, we just moved in up the road, my wife and I. It was in the basement of the old farmhouse up the street. I moved toward him with my hand held out to shake his hand and saw that my fingers were smudged black with the box's darkness. He backed away, slamming into the wall behind him and sending a framed photo crashing to the floor, the glass shattering loudly. Don't touch me! Don't touch anything! Just get out! Get out and put that thing back where you found it! 
If you do anything else with it, you will never get your life back. You should have never taken it from its resting place. You should have never come here! I backed away from him, terrified even more than before, especially knowing now that others were aware of the dark powers this box contained. Whatever it was, it was not meant to be moved. Its resting place was of extreme importance. Maybe that was why the house had been so cheap. It came with a cursed basement. The man began to throw things at me, shouting in a foreign language I didn't recognize, then speaking harshly in English, telling me to leave and never come back. He spoke in prayer-like incantations and made the sign of the cross over and over again. I stumbled out of my car and started the engine, driving back towards the farmhouse and wishing we'd never purchased the place. When I pulled up outside the farmhouse, I tried to decide what to say to my wife. How would I explain to her that the box couldn't be moved? Maybe if we just left it in the basement, the presence would leave us alone. I decided I would just try to sneak it in and put it back in the basement without her noticing. I would explain it to her later, or at least try to. The important thing now seemed to be to return it to its proper place before something really terrible happened. Going back inside the house, I closed the front door behind me as softly as I could and glanced up the stairs. The light was off in the bedroom, so I assumed Christine would still be up there. I went to the basement door and opened it quietly, being careful not to make too much noise in case Christine had gone back to sleep again upstairs. I began heading down into the darkness beneath the house. I was holding the box carefully in my hands like a live bomb, since I wasn't sure what would happen if I dropped it or did anything wrong. Each creaking stair made my heart hammer faster as I trod down towards the dirt floor of the basement. Finally, I set foot down there and looked around, seeing only shadows. The light from upstairs was dim, and it was the only source I had to see by. My phone was in my pocket, and I kept it there, thinking I would only be down there for a few moments. Walking across the blackened space towards the alcove which had housed the black box, I began to feel watched again. It was only then that I noticed that sensation had been gone for a while, as I drove to the antique store and back again. Whatever had been with the box watching me, it had not stayed inside after the thing had been opened. It had stayed in the house, with my wife. A loud bang came from the top of the stairs, and the entire basement went completely pitch black in an instant. I realized the door had slammed shut, and I figured Christine had closed it. Maybe she didn't realize I was home. I began to fumble for the cell phone in my pocket, needing a bit of light to feel safe down in this terrifying basement but before I could grab it, something attacked me. The shrieking wail it made was inhuman and full of rage. It swiped at me with sharp claws in the darkness as I rolled and ducked away from it, trying to escape. I threw the box down to the floor, hoping to get away. As I got up, I hit my head on a dangling wooden cross and nearly got wrapped up in the twine which suspended it from the ceiling. Stumbling, I tried to find my way to the stairs, screaming for my wife to help me. She didn't answer. A moment later, the thing came at me again. It was fast, but thin, and just a bit weaker than me, despite its anger. I managed to grab its wrists and push it up against the wall, then tripped it to the floor. I ran up the stairs, stumbling on the steps and scraping my shins, bloodying them badly. Just as I reached the top, the thing came at me again, relentless, screaming ancient curses with spittle flying in my face. It swiped at my eyes and got one of them blinding me. The door was just behind me, so I flung it open and shoved the thing away from me. And as the light from the main level came flooding in through the open door, I saw what had been attacking me. My wife tumbled down the steps, cracking her head against the wall on the way down and falling lifelessly to the dirt floor of the basement below. I took a few shaky steps down the stairs, looking to confirm if my eyes had deceived me, but they had not. The thing in the box had stayed behind when I left, and it had possessed my wife driving her down into the darkness of its lair, where it felt most at home. As I stood there staring at her lifeless body, I saw her begin to twitch. Her fingers began to drum up and down. Then her head began to rock and make a loud, smacking noise as her forehead impacted the basement floor again and again, hard. Christine? I called down the stairs. Stop! Stop! Please! She continued the self-destructive behavior, smashing her skull hard against the dirt floor. 
I began to take a shaky step down to stop her, but then hesitated. That thing was still inside of her, and it wasn't safe. And yet I couldn't let her just keep hurting herself like that. The meaty sound repeated again and again as I screamed for her to stop, but she wouldn't. But I wouldn't go down there again. And eventually the thing inside of her realized that. Come and save me, honey, she said in a droning beehive voice. I need you. No. I just stood at the top of the stairs, waiting. My wife appeared to have broken a few limbs during her fall, but that didn't stop her from moving quickly. Sickening sounds of bone crunching could be heard from the top of the stairs as she got to her feet. Her one ankle failing so that she rested her weight on the splintered nub of her tibia, rather than on her foot. Whatever was inside of her felt no pain, but it looked agonizing to me. She began to shuffle up the wooden stairs without warning, moving faster than I thought possible crab-like and inhuman on four legs. It looked like she wouldn't be able to make it on her fractured bones, and yet she moved like a relentless insect, her other limbs making up for the deficits of her lost one. Using her arms like additional legs, she began to crawl towards me up the stairs, her fingernails digging into the splintered wooden stairs and breaking off as she raced faster and faster, gaining momentum. I realized at the last second that I'd been paralyzed with terror and threw the door shut, just as she slammed into it with a shuddering bang that rattled the upstairs windows in their frames. There was no lock on the door, and I could do nothing but hold it closed with all the weight of my body. She wouldn't relent for a second, turning the doorknob constantly, pressing with all of her strength against the door, as I grit my teeth and fought against her weight. I'm sitting here still. With my back pressed up against the door, my feet wedged against the opposing wall with all the force I can muster. When I finish typing this out, I don't know what I'll do. Maybe I'll try the police and see what they say. My biggest concern is that they'll want to let her out. She'll probably pretend to be normal when they arrive. She'll pretend I'm insane, that I attacked her. But I know that's not her. It's the thing from the basement. The thing from the black box. Whatever it is, she can't be allowed to bring it back to the surface. It was locked down in that basement for a reason. And that's where it needs to stay. With the leaves finally falling, I decided to write down what happened last autumn. I know my family has demanded answers all year, and most people have created a distance when I refuse to give them. What I saw would simply not be believed. I risk them locking me up for my own good if they knew the truth. I need to be free. To prepare for this year. I refuse to give up on the hope that my son is still out there. I hope this provides some warning for others. Two years ago, my wife left for no reason I could understand. She was just gone one day, leaving our son behind. As kids do, he blamed himself. He was only five. How could he just accept he'd never see her again? We pushed through it the best we could. After a year, he finally seemed to be dealing with her missing in our lives. It was hard being a single parent, but that doesn't mean I regret it. I love my son more than anything. I gladly picked up the extra shifts and made sacrifices for him. Last year we planned his trick-or-treating route, unaware he wouldn't be able to enjoy Halloween as expected. I had a rare day off on a perfect autumn day. It wasn't too chilly, the wind blew through the trees. Everything looked so golden. Carson played in the backyard without a care in the world. I needed to clean the massive number of leaves in the yard, so I asked him to help. He enjoyed being useful, even if he wasn't. By the end of our chore, we had amassed a huge pile. And what should you do with a pile of leaves? Carefully toss your son into them. He giggled until his face was red. I tossed him a few times to see his little body squirming with joy. He decided to see how high he could jump on his own. I watched his small legs do an awkward running jump and him tackle the pile. 
I heard the giggles for a second. Then a sound no parent ever wants to hear. A scream for help. For some reason, the scream sounded too far away. I stood, shocked for a second, which was far too long. I dove in, my hands out looking for him. My hands felt nothing, my body lurching forward. I tossed aside leaves to see the most confusing sight my brain didn't understand. There was a hole, so dark and deep I couldn't see the bottom of it. There was no way this had been there a second before. I didn't care the reason the hole appeared, only that my son was down there. I carefully put my legs over the edge, calling for him and saying that I was on my way. I let myself drop down, my brain a mess and not thinking clearly. All I wanted was to see if my son was all right. I lost track of time. The air felt hot and suffocating. I had no control over my body as well. When I did hit the ground, I expected it to kill me, but instead I landed on something soft and slightly warm. To say it felt disgusting was an understatement. I reached into my pocket for my phone to find it was not there. I cursed myself for leaving it to charge inside the house before I started raking the leaves. I took a moment to look around. The walls were made of thick tangles of fleshy vines. The vines quickly closed over the hole I dropped from, causing my only path to be forward. I didn't see any sign of my son. An odd, almost tangy smell hovered in the air. My eyes took a few minutes to get adjusted to the light and I stumbled along the uneven ground. I knew it wasn't wise, but I shouted for Carson, hoping he would hear me. First, I needed to find him. Then I could figure out where the hell I ended up and how to get out of here. As I moved, the walls got closer until I was just barely squeezing by. The vines made my skin crawl. I swore I could feel some sort of pulse going through them when I pressed on through the narrow pathways. The path opened into two options. I stood debating on what to do. I didn't have anything to mark the way with. If I picked the wrong way, I risked never getting back here again. Which way did Carson go? I shouted his name again down each tunnel. I waited for an answer and then shouted again. A noise came after I paused, calling for him. I held my breath, hoping he finally heard me. Instead of a familiar voice, a gurgling noise echoed down the right pathway. I strained my eyes to see what could be the cause. Something started to come into focus. A figure not entirely human, but not like any kind of animal I'd ever seen. Just as I started to take a step closer, a hand wrapped around my wrist, making me jump. What the hell? I started as I struggled to get my hand back. Something shot out from the darkness. The stranger that came up out of nowhere moved faster than I could see. He caught the whip that nearly took my head off and cut it with a very large knife. The thing in the darkness let out a screech. I didn't need any more convincing or prodding. When the man started to run down the left pathway, I was right behind him. Or at least mostly right behind him. I struggled to move as fast as he did. I nearly twisted my ankle a few times trying to run across the lumpy ground. At least he was decent enough to let me catch up. He stopped inside a larger room with at least ten different openings to different paths. I gasped for air as he waited for me to recover. What the hell? Just in general, I said, my face still red from running so hard. I looked the stranger over. He was taller than me and well-built. His eyes were a steel gray that matched his hair. A small pack was strapped to his waist. Aside from a water bottle and his knife, he was light on supplies. Little voice, he replied in a thick accent that was almost hard to understand. I found someone who might be able to help, and yet we might have issues because of a language barrier. I figured he wanted me to talk lower, so whatever we ran into before didn't find us. I'm looking for my son. He's seven. Looks like me. Have you seen him? I half whispered. The man was in the middle of turning away when I spoke. He paused to consider my question. At least he seemed to understand what I was saying. Finally, he shook his head, which hurt my chest. I need to find him. I don't care about anything else. Can you help? You, you act like you know what's happening. He shook his head. 
I wasn't sure if he just didn't want to talk or knew as much as I did. I heard a sound from down one of the tunnels. The man started to jog away, and I followed him. The damp air made it hard to breathe as we moved along. I desperately wanted answers. In the back of my mind, I thought this was all a dream. Maybe I had hit my head when I jumped into the pile of leaves. But if I treated it as a dream, then I would doom myself if I was really awake. We silently moved along, and thankfully we didn't come across any more of those creatures. I started to notice scraps of fabric tied to the fleshy vines that made up the walls. This man must have marked his way. Just how long had he been here? At some point, the tunnels became so dark it was nearly impossible to see. The stranger didn't appear to have any issues, though. He silently made me hold on to the back of his shirt so I didn't get lost, which was a bit embarrassing. We stopped at another fork in the tunnels. One pathway was marked. For some reason, we went into the opening that didn't have a piece of clothing as a marker. I kept my eyes open for any signs of my son. I wondered if I should have just stayed in one spot waiting for him to find me. But if I did that, would one of those creatures find me first? Soon we came across something that showed just how dangerous this place was. A dim light sat on the floor of the tunnel we started along. A battery-powered lantern cast a weak light, alone and forgotten. I doubted the body near it was the person who owned the lantern at some point, but there was no sign of who left it behind. The rot and wear on the body showed that they had been down here for a long time. The closer we got, the more the smell grew. I looked away, not wanting to see the dead. My stomach turned at the sight. The man didn't stop. He walked over to start searching the body for anything useful. I was horrified, but understood why he did so. I turned my eyes back to see him pull out a small gun from the half-rotten coat. The small weapon looked like a toy. The metal a bright blue. The man removed part of the gun, and it appeared it had a spot for a USB cable or something of the sort. Did the gun light up or something like that? Why bring a toy here? Even though the gun was useless, he still put it away in his small pack. He retrieved a small knife, which was better than nothing. But he also found a notebook that had somehow avoided the rot. He was going to leave it behind, but paused. He handed the notebook to me, which I accepted fairly confused about how this might be helpful. The cover had some sort of company symbol I didn't recognize. I felt disappointed when I opened the book to see a language I also didn't know. It almost appeared like English, making me assume it was written in some sort of code. A bit of writing almost looked like 2136 was at the top of a page. But if I squinted, the scratches could have been anything. I can't make any sense of this. Hey, is it safe to head back to where we came from? I really need to find my son. I pressed as I dropped the book back to the ground. He stared at me with a stone-cold gaze that gave nothing away. "'What's your name? I'm Mark,' I said as I held out my hand. Since we had met in such a frantic manner, we didn't have a chance to talk. I thought that maybe getting to know him better would make him listen to my request. "'Ivan,' he said, and started back down where we came from. I collected the lantern. I found a scrap of fabric to tie the handle to my belt loop, so I had my hands free. "'Are you from Russia?' I questioned as we walked. Ukraine, he replied, then refused to say more. Since this was a year ago, I, I didn't really understand the difference between the two countries. We kept our eyes out for signs of the creature we encountered and for my son. This place felt endless. No matter how long we walked, it didn't seem as if we made any progress. I started to get thirsty. A horrible fact dawned on me. There was nothing to eat or drink down here. Couldn't a person only live for three days without water? If Ivan was still alive, he either had only been here for two days or knew where to get something to drink. I put the issue to the back of my mind to focus on looking for Carson. We came across a new body. As Ivan searched for something useful, my face got hot. We weren't heading back to where we came from since we hadn't seen this body yet. I thought we were going to go back to look for my son, I hissed, trying to whisper. I was mostly ignored. Ivan paused to point at a patch on the dead man's jacket as if it meant something. Same, he said, but that didn't mean anything to me. So what if both bodies were from the same group? What did that have to do with anything? My son is very young. He's, he's alone and he's scared. 
I need to get to him as soon as possible. Whatever you're looking for can wait, I said, my tone rising. Ivan hushed me, which didn't calm my anger in the slightest. If you told me what's going on or what you're looking for, I could help. Whatever it is can't be more important than... He didn't need to warn me about my voice being too loud. A sudden, hot flash came from my shoulder, causing me to stumble forwards. I turned on my heel, nearly tripping on the uneven ground. Blood started to soak my shirt, showing I had been cut by something. In the darkness of the tunnel, more of those creatures waited. They howled, each voice echoing down the tunnel, causing my blood to turn cold. We need to get the hell out of here, I shouted, ready to run. For some reason, Ivan didn't get up from the body. He was still looking for something in the pockets. Soon, the creatures came into view. They looked like human figures made up of those fleshy vines that covered everywhere else. One of those vines snapped outwards, missing my face by a hair. I started moving while I begged Ivan to come with me. He found what he was looking for, just as the horde of monsters charged forward. He stood up, the ridiculous plastic gun in hand. He didn't flinch as he pulled the trigger. A blast of light shot out, burning away the entire tunnel. The creatures were gone in a flash of white, leaving nothing behind. The walls of vines were nothing but a charred mass. A terrible roar echoed through the tunnels that nearly deafened my ears. Within seconds, more vines came to cover the damaged areas. I stood, mouth open in shock over what I had just seen. Buddy, one shot. Lucky, Ivan said, his voice as steady as ever. But how? What? I didn't add much to the conversation. I just followed behind him and we started to move. He let me take some time to think over what I just witnessed. Where are we? I finally asked. I didn't expect him to answer, but he did. Stomach. That horrible thought sank in. I ended up in the belly of a beast. Not just myself, but poor Carson as well. What kind of beast? This was more like hell than the stomach of a monster. What's your? Ivan asked. I shook my head, not understanding his question. 2022, I answered, unsure of why that was important. 2035. His reply made me stop in my tracks. He also stopped studying my expression. I didn't want to believe him, but I also didn't want to admit I was stuck inside a monster that appeared out of nowhere. If I hadn't seen that gun wipe out so many creatures, I wouldn't have believed him. He'd gotten stuck in the same monster, but from years into the future. Not only that, but people with far more advanced tech had also ended up here, and they died. I wondered why someone would have died with one shot left in such an impressive weapon. Then I realized he might have been able to avoid the monsters, but not the lack of water. I took a deep breath, gathering myself after everything I learned in such a short amount of time. Okay, I have answers now. I just need to focus on two things, finding my son and getting us out of here. My goal stayed the same. As long as I was alive, I refused to give up on him. Ivan raised an eyebrow, giving the most amount of emotion I've seen from him. Think boy is alive? He said, but his tone wasn't cruel. Yes, no matter what, he's alive. The moment I think otherwise is when he's truly dead. Besides, from all I've seen so far, there's some good signs saying he'll be fine. There are other people here, right? If he meets one of those guys with a gun, he'll be safe. I'm, I'm sure of it. I know people would call me delusional. I still refuse to believe anything happened to my son unless I saw his body for myself. If I accepted there was no chance for him, that's it. There would be no reason for me to keep going. Yes, good. Ivan appeared to be on my side. We walked for what seemed like hours. I think Ivan took breaks for my sake. He appeared to be the kind of person to just keep going non-stop. We arrived where I thought I had shown up, but with everything looking the same, I wasn't certain. We found no traces of a child who had come through here. I considered that Carson was dropped off somewhere else. That somehow the entrance I fell inside had more than one opening. I finally needed a real break. My body refused to move for much longer unless I got some sleep. Without a working watch, we had no way of knowing how much time had passed. Ivan said I should sleep first. He kept watch. When he woke me, I barely felt any better. 
He trusted me enough to keep watch long enough for him to rest. I think he was only asleep for an hour at most. This man was built far differently than me. As we traveled, he rarely spoke. He pointed to the scraps of fabric, using a few words to explain which knot meant the tunnel was safe. I thought it was impossible to keep track of the tunnels. Somehow, he memorized so many different paths. He stopped in front of one opening marked with two scraps. Very bad. Never go, he warned. My skin prickled as my mind raced thinking about just how awful this place could get. And because he was warning me, it, it meant he thought we might get separated at some point. He led us down an unmarked tunnel for us to find another one of those creatures. I even went into action. Within seconds, his knife hacked away at the monster's face until all the vines stopped moving. Thank God he was on my side. I started to worry the rest of my life would be just following him and standing back as he took care of the threats. More hours passed without any progress. I needed to rest again. And when I woke up, I was more exhausted than before I slept. I need something to drink. Do you have any water? I asked. Not once had I watched him drink from his water bottle. He shook his head and even shook the bottle, showing it was empty. I groaned as fear set into my stomach. If I didn't get something to drink soon, I would end up as one of those bodies we found. Silently, Ivan went over to the walls with knife in hand. He sliced the flesh open, holding his water bottle under the wound. The small cut closed over in under a minute, but he collected enough of the clear, pinkish liquid. My stomach turned from hunger and disgust. Is that safe to drink? He took a few moments to find the right words. Yes, little sips, big sips, body as them. He tapped his knife against the fleshy wall. My head started to spin over what he said. Those creatures we faced had been people at some point. If we got desperate enough to consume parts of the prison we found ourselves in, we risked becoming a part of it. The cut on my shoulder stung and my throat hurt like hell. My body needed to eat and drink something soon. I still shook my head, refusing the idea. I can go without for a little longer. I didn't know how much longer, but I needed to put off drinking that horrible liquid for as long as possible. Ivan agreed, but he didn't dump out his water bottle. He just strapped it back to his waist, ready to go. I thought he needed to rest, but he refused. At that moment, I didn't know what kept him so motivated. Now I think he wanted to find Carson just as much as I did. I lost track of time down there. I knew it hadn't been three days just yet. I was starting to lose the battle against not drinking from the walls. Ivan started to give me concerned looks over his shoulder. He kept the knife in his hand. I soon figured out that wasn't in case we came across more monsters. He was ready to put me out of my misery if it got to that point. I considered the fact that I wasn't the first person he needed to take care of. A sound echoed against the walls. I stopped in my tracks. My body prickled with energy again. That wasn't the voice of the creatures, it was the small cry of a child. I bolted in the direction, Ivan shouting at me to stop. His voice nearly got through to me. I kept running even after I saw that the sounds were coming from a pathway that had been marked with two scraps of fabric. It wasn't the first path Ivan warned me about. There had been a few of these dangerous tunnels we passed by. Soon I started tripping over bones and half-rotten bodies. Again, I didn't care. I heard the single word that kept me going. Daddy? I didn't see Carson, but I knew his voice. A body rose up from the ground, face torn and filled with vines. I kicked it as hard as I could to keep it down. The lantern I tied to my pants hit the back of my leg as I ran. I was still thankful for it. I turned it on to see better in the dark tunnel. My heart stopped when I saw the first dead end I'd come across in this place. And at the end was Carson, crying and surrounded by those monsters. I screamed at them, drawing their attention in my direction. My son wailed from fear. I didn't blame him. My knees shook seeing all those creatures facing towards me. A vine shot out, catching my arm. I fought through the pain to get free. Within seconds, more of those vines came down lashing at my exposed skin. 
I covered my face with my arms, so they took most of the damage. When the creatures paused in their attacks, I looked up long enough to see my son leaning into a small hole in the wall that hadn't been there before. Carson! I shouted at him. He met my eyes and hesitated. With tears streaming down his cheeks, he started to run. My little boy disappeared into the new opening. It was a smart move, but it hurt to see. I forced myself to charge forward. I punched the first creature as hard as I could. The thing went down, but two more took its place. I turned into an animal, thrashing, screaming, and fighting for my life. I used the lantern as a blunt object. I'm certain I killed one of those monsters after bringing it down into their face repeatedly. Those monsters screeched, backing up. I wasn't going to win this fight even if they were now a little scared of me. Move! I listened to that order just in time. Another blast of light came from down the tunnel, cleaning out the remaining creatures in front of me. The entire area shook as a massive rumbling scream tore through the air. I looked up to see Ivan racing towards me. He must have searched the bodies I ignored when I ran past them to find one more shot. My heart sank when I saw more of the creatures behind him. So many were on his heels they filled the entire tunnel. He reached me and grabbed my arm. He hauled me to my feet to drag me back to the dead end. The boy? He asked out of breath. He was here. He went into a new pathway that closed. I explained as I was dragged backward. Good. For the first time, Ivan smiled. I may have found Carson alive, but we were facing too many of those creatures. I looked over my shoulder, seeing something I hadn't noticed before. The blast tore open a hole just large enough for us to fit inside, but it was rapidly closing. An opening that had specked spotlight coming through. Go. Live for sun. I felt his large hand on my chest. With a push, he shoved me backward into the opening. I felt my body falling downwards as I reached for him. I couldn't leave him behind like this, but I had no control over what had just happened. I tumbled out of a pile of leaves, the clean air filling my lungs. I scrambled back to the pile the moment my body let me move over there to look for the hole. No matter how hard I looked, it wasn't there. I was covered in injuries and dehydrated. I didn't have much strength left, and yet I pounded my fists on the cool grass. Tears flooded my vision as I thought of Carson and Ivan alone in such a terrible place. After a while, I calmed down and went inside. I grabbed my cell phone froze, not knowing what to say. No one would believe me. Not only that, but I saw just how long I was missing. Three minutes. The gears started to turn my head. If I had been down there for days, and yet it was only three minutes out here, then how long was a full year? Could Carson and Ivan live that long? I put my phone back down. After treating my wounds as best as I could, I headed back outside looking for another strange hole. I must have been in shock. I stayed outside for a full day wandering, looking for something I never found. Almost a year has passed since that day. There isn't a single moment I don't think of those two. I reported my son missing. There was no proof I harmed him, so the police didn't arrest me. There were a lot of questions, though. I started working out. If I had been just a bit stronger and faster, then maybe I could have reached Carson in time. I haven't been able to dig up any details about the horrors I encountered. But I have noticed an increase in missing pets lately. A little girl who lived on this block went missing two days ago. Her father said he looked away from the yard for just a few moments. Everyone assumes she was taken by someone, but I know better. I've used every moment for the past year to prepare for this. I know that my son is alive. I know I'm going to find another hole, and I'll be able to save him. I'm positive about all of this. After all, the moment I give up on hope, that's when he really dies. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zwall, 
Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamakado, Dante Kincaid, Saren Ray, Angela Donovan, Clarion 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Bert Turner, Lajani Aspinall, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Carrie Harkonnen, LaDonna Spivey, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart, Sherman Davis, Bryce Shelton, Susan McClendon, Elise Batisse, Lisa and the Cult Jam, Open Circuit, Fabula Vore, Raymond Jaggers, That Darn Fox, Raison Detra, Kai Gaming 99, Wendy Burns, The Wendigo, Michael Squishy Park, The Gem Star, Vault 77 Citizen, Puppy Dan, Clovis Wolf, Elder Elm, Derek Prey, Elder Being, KC Hawaii, Rob T, Tragic Mermaid, Darren Fishnaller, Clove Zenoya Harris, Roe Underwood, Florida Man Luke, Bethany's Mom, Winter's Kiss, Sam Brook, and the White Stag. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content, as well as the Discord channel. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. It really does help out a lot. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.